C-SPAN 2 is a public service created by America's cable television companies. Each weekend on C-SPAN 2, look for About Books, original programming devoted to books, authors, bookstores, and the publishing industry. Here's a look at our programming lineup. Next, a House Oversight Subcommittee hearing on the Internal Revenue Service. Then at 8.15 a.m., Secretary of State Madeleine Albright speaks at the Los Angeles Times Washington Bureau editorial meeting. After that, the Senate meets to continue debating a bill regarding nuclear waste storage sites. And at 1 p.m., live coverage of Dr. Ian Wilmot, the man who successfully cloned a sheep, speaking at the National Press Club. Now a hearing on the operations of the Internal Revenue Service. Yesterday, a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee looked at the financial management of the agency, its modernized computer system, and its customer service. Several IRS officials testified. California Congressman Steve Horn chaired this four-hour hearing. Management Information Technology will come to order. Today, the subcommittee revisits the issue of management at the Internal Revenue Service, IRS. The problem before us is the apparent inability of the IRS to adapt to the information and accountability demands of the late 20th century. One year ago, this subcommittee held a hearing on financial management at the IRS. At that hearing, we discussed the IRS's revenue accounting system, which is in such disarray it cannot even be audited. We also reviewed the IRS's problems with collections, management of accounts receivable, filing fraud and fraudulent refunds, records retention, tax lien recovery, and personal browsing of taxpayer records. It was not a short hearing. Last September, we held another hearing on IRS financial management. At that session, we received more reassurances that improvements were underway. Yet, here we are today, reading the steady stream of press reports on feeble management, failed automation, and poor customer service at the IRS. The list of failed projects only grows longer. The Tax Systems Modernization Project, a $4 billion attempt to modernize the IRS's decades-old computer systems, CyberFile, a project that would have allowed taxpayers to prepare and electronically submit their tax returns from their personal computers, Integrated Case Processing, a program that would have allowed IRS representatives to access all data needed in order to answer taxpayer questions over the telephone. The Document Processing System, a system that would have scanned paper documents and electronically captured data for subsequent processing and retrieval, and even the Service Center Recognition Image Processing System, the failed document scanning program that the Document Processing System was designed to replace. I hope we'll not have to add to this list the year 2000 computer software conversion problem. It would be a catastrophe not only for the IRS, but for all other agencies and organizations that depend on IRS information. A Senate hearing last week focused on the problem of certain IRS employees snooping in the agency's taxpayer computer files. The IRS had previously announced a policy of zero tolerance for this inappropriate browsing and assured Congress that the problem had been solved. Yet the General Accounting Office has just released evidence that personnel snooping continues. It is tempting to solve many of the problems at the IRS by contracting out various functions, especially those in information technology development. But this will only work if the IRS can specify its objectives and access the costs and the time it will take. The IRS must also be able to determine whether delays in delivery of components of the system are going to cause delays in the whole implementation process and what the implications of such delays will be. It is not clear that the leadership of the IRS at this point is up to the challenge. Contracting out is clearly not a panacea. One can hope that the Government Performance and Results Act is forcing top management at IRS to reevaluate what they're doing and how they're doing it. 
Federal agencies right now are supposed to be consulting with congressional committees of jurisdiction to refine their strategic and performance plans and proposals for how they're going to measure results. This is an excellent opportunity to put into place a new approach in doing business. But from what we've seen so far of the plans and performance measures that the IRS is developing, it's still business as usual. At this point, the subcommittee hopes that improvement will occur. There are several important questions that must be answered. What does the IRS need to do to get its modernization project back on the track? How is the Treasury going to ensure that IRS embarks on a modernization plan that will work? What sort of milestones or benchmarks should a modernization plan have so that its progress can be monitored? How long do we have to wait to see results? Will the right people be held accountable? How can we overcome obstacles to change such as the organizational culture of the IRS? How do we modify it? How do we make sure the IRS can manage multi-million dollar information technology development projects that often amount to several billions before we know they've failed? even if such projects are going to be given to outside contractors. The IRS needs to be accountable. Americans have a right to know whether the agency that collects taxes from their hard-earned money is capable of managing internal operations in an efficient, fair, and accountable way. The IRS emphasizes the need to maintain taxpayers' faith in the voluntary compliance system. That faith is undermined by stories of refund fraud and of translators helping illegal aliens to get refunds. We need to know that the IRS has adequate control over refund fraud. We need to know that the information provided in their financial statements is reliable. We need to know that the IRS gives good information to taxpayers in response to their telephone queries. We need to know that the IRS treats all taxpayers fairly and appropriately. We need to know that the IRS is collecting the proper amount of taxes at the lowest possible cost to the public. These are the measures of success. We welcome our guest today who will be testifying on a number of these questions. We will be hearing first from Linda Willis of the General Accounting Office. She's Director for Tax Administration and Policy and will discuss the progress the IRS has made in acting on recommendations submitted by GAO to improve IRS operations. Robert Tobias of the National Treasury Employees Union will represent the IRS employees' views on how to restore public and congressional confidence in the IRS. Sheldon Cohen, former IRS commissioner during the Johnson administration and now a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, will tell the subcommittee how the situation looks from his vantage point. He was commissioner when IRS first started to computerize its operations. Also testifying will be Shelley Davis, former IRS historian, the only one it's ever had. She will present her views on why the IRS is in trouble, what they can do to get back on the track. The IRS will have an opportunity to tell us about its own plans. Deputy Commissioner Michael Dolan will provide us with testimony on the IRS's approach to modernization. Originally, Rob Portman, representative from Ohio, co-chairman of the congressionally appointed National Commission on Restructuring IRS, and a member of this subcommittee, had planned to give his perspective on some of the ideas for how we can make sure the IRS becomes a well-managed agency. Unfortunately, he's detained back in Ohio. The views of the National Commission will be given by Jeffrey S. Trinka, the chief of staff of the commission. Uh, we welcome all of you. Uh, we had also invited Jim Traficant and other representatives from Hawaii, uh, from Ohio, uh, to present his views on changing the burden of proof in tax disputes from the taxpayer to the IRS, a proposal that would level the playing field. Unfortunately, Mr. Traficant cannot be with us today, but he's provided us with a written statement that will be included in the hearing record at the end of the opening statements without objection. This subcommittee does not like to be unduly pessimistic. For every problem, there are opportunities not only to solve the problem, but to make things better than they were before. I've gone on record as advising the President that he should be judicious in his choice of the new IRS Commissioner. It should not be someone who's simply a very bright and uh, outstanding CPA tax accountant. It should not be someone who's simply a very bright and outstanding tax lawyer. It should be someone who has demonstrable management expertise in providing leadership 
to large, complex organizations. As we know, the IRS has 106,000 or so employees. Uh, next to the Pentagon, it's really the second largest uh, federal service, uh, excluding the post office that is now largely uh, independent. And at this point, I'd like to uh, yield to uh, Mr. Sununu, gentleman from New Hampshire, for any opening statement that he has to make. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have an opening, uh, a full opening statement uh, this morning, but I certainly want to uh, uh, thank the uh, uh, witnesses that are going to be pro providing testimony today. Certainly your appearance here before the committee is, uh, is extremely timely. Uh, as we move forward uh, toward the 21st century, toward the century change, uh, and look at the technological issues uh, that are facing all of government's uh, areas of administration, but in particular, uh, the Internal Revenue Service and their attempts to improve their operations in such a way as to uh, not just promote efficiency and, and capability within the organization, but hopefully to restore some public confidence uh, in the integrity of the, uh, uh, the operations of government's financial systems. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, to bring uh, modern management techniques, information systems, uh, and the kind of changes uh, that will make a difference, uh, as I say, in both the, in terms of how we operate a government, but in restoring public confidence uh, to the operations of one of the most important uh, agencies in government. So I look forward to the testimony today and, uh, and hope uh, we will have the opportunity to ask some uh, uh, questions that might shed additional light onto where the opportunities for improvement might exist. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. And uh, now we will swear in the panel one witnesses, Linda D. Willis, the Director of Tax Policy and Administration, General Government Division, U.S. General Accounting Office. She is accompanied by Rona B. Sullivan, the Chief Scientist for Computers and Telecommunications, U.S. General Accounting Office. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Both witnesses have affirmed, the clerk will note, and uh, please proceed, uh, Ms. Willis, as you know the routine. Uh, we'd like you to summarize your statement, since we have all the statement and had it in advance. And, uh, but uh, this is an important subject, and if you go over 10 minutes in summary, I'm not going to be offended, because I'd like you to get out your key points on the record. Thank so you, please Chairman. proceed. Uh, we will submit our written uh, statement for the record. We're very pleased to be here today to testify before the subcommittee on GAO's high-risk work. A key factor in understanding IRS's ongoing difficulties in the high-risk areas is the realization that its major processes and systems were developed and implemented decades ago and were not designed to address the critical needs and vulnerabilities that confront IRS in the 1990s. In addition, the problems IRS faces in eliminating its high-risk vulnerabilities are compounded by their interdependencies. IRS's success in addressing the weaknesses in its program areas is clearly linked to the successful modernization of its systems. However, this understanding does not mitigate our concern over IRS's progress in developing a comprehensive strategy or detailed business plan for modernizing its outdated processes and systems. For years, we have chronicled IRS's struggle to manage its operations and have made scores of recommendations to improve IRS systems, processes, and procedures. In order to achieve its stated goals of reducing the volume of paper tax returns, providing better customer service, and improving compliance with the nation's tax laws, IRS needs to develop a comprehensive business strategy to ensure that new and revised business processes drive systems development and acquisition. Solving the problems in the high-risk areas is not an insurmountable task, but it requires sustained management commitment, accurate information systems, and reliable performance measures to track IRS's progress and provide the data necessary to make informed management and oversight decisions. There are four long-standing high-risk areas at IRS, tax systems modernization, financial management, accounts receivable, and filing fraud. In addition, two of the new government-wide high-risk areas also directly affect IRS's operations, information security and the year 2000 problem or century date change. 
Turning to each of these in turn, I would like to briefly discuss the progress IRS has made and the measures IRS must, must take to resolve the issues. In Jan July 1995, we reported that IRS one, did not have a comprehensive business strategy to effectively reduce paper tax return filings. Two, had not yet fully developed and put in place the requisite management, software development, and technical infrastructure necessary to successfully implement its ambitious world-class modernization. And three, lacked an overall systems architecture or blueprint to guide the modernization's development and evolution. At that time, we made over a dozen recommendations to the IRS Commissioner to address these weaknesses. In 1996, we reported that IRS had initiated many activities to improve its modernization efforts, but had not yet fully implemented any of our recommendations. Since then, IRS has taken additional steps. For example, a new Chief Information Officer has been hired, as well as additional technical expertise. IRS also created an investment review board that has reevaluated and terminated several modernization development projects that were found to be not cost effective. IRS is also updating its systems development life cycle methodology and is developing a systems architecture and project sequency plan for the modernization. While we recognize IRS's actions, we remain concerned while because we remain concerned because much remains to be done to fully implement essential improvements. It will take both management commitment and technical discipline for IRS to accomplish these tasks. Furthermore, despite persisting weaknesses in both software development and acquisition capabilities, IRS continues to request hundreds of millions of dollars for systems modernization efforts. In its fiscal year 1998 budget request, IRS and the administration are seeking $131 million for system development initiatives and $500 million in each of the next two fiscal years for yet to be specified modernization efforts. However, the requests do not include credible justifications for the spending and are not based on analytical data or derived using formal cost estimating techniques. Accordingly, we believe that Congress should consider not funding either request. Turning to financial management, our audits of IRS's financial statements have outlined the substantial improvements needed in IRS's accounting and reporting in order to fully comply with the requirements of the CFO Act. The audits for fiscal years 1992 to 1995 have described IRS's difficulties in one, properly accounting for its tax revenues in total and by reported type of tax, two, reliably determining the amount of accounts receivable owed for unpaid taxes, three, regularly reconciling its fund balance with Treasury accounts, and four, either routinely providing support for the receipt of goods and services it purchases or where supported accurately recording the purchased item in the proper period. IRS has made progress in addressing problems in these areas and has developed an action plan with specific timetables and deliverables to address the issues our financial statement audits have identified. IRS has been working to position itself to have more reliable financial statements for fiscal year 1997 and thereafter. To accomplish this, especially in accounting for revenue and related accounts receivables, IRS will need to institute long-term solutions involving reprogramming software for its antiquated systems and developing new systems as required. Follow-through is essential to complete corrective measures if IRS is to solve its financial management problems. IRS's ability to effectively address its accounts receivable problems is seriously hampered by its outdated equipment and processes, incomplete information needed to better target collection efforts, and the absence of a comprehensive strategy and detailed plan to address the systemic nature of the underlying problems. IRS's collection efforts have also been hampered by the age of the delinquent tax accounts. In the past two years, IRS has undertaken several initiatives to overcome its deficiencies. Specifically, it has efforts underway to correct errors in its master file records of tax receivables, develop profiles of delinquent taxpayers, and study the effectiveness of various collection techniques. It has also streamlined its collection process, placed additional emphasis on contacting repeat delinquents, made its collection notices more readable, and targeted compliance-generated delinquencies for earlier intervention. 
In part due to these efforts, IRS reported collecting more in delinquent taxes in fiscal year 1996 than it ever has, almost $30 billion. Despite these positive results, IRS needs to continue the development of information databases and performance measures to afford its managers the data needed to determine which action or improvements generate the desired changes in IRS's programs and operations. Mr. Chairman, this is not a short-term commitment. It will take some time before the full results of the new initiatives are realized. IRS must take deliberate action to ensure that its problem-solving efforts are on the right track. It needs to implement a comprehensive strategy that involves all aspects of IRS's operations and that sets priorities, accelerates the modernization of outdated equipment and processes, and establishes realistic goals, specific timetables, and a system to measure progress. Turning to filing fraud, when we first identified filing fraud as a high-risk area in 1995, the amount of filing fraud being detected by IRS was on an upward spiral. Since then, IRS has introduced new controls and expanded existing controls in an attempt to reduce its exposure. These controls are directed toward either preventing the filing of fraudulent returns or identifying questionable returns after they have been filed. IRS its efforts have produced some positive results. For example, IRS efforts to validate Social Security numbers on paper returns produced over $800 million in reduced refunds or additional taxes. IRS was less successful in identifying fraudulent returns, identifying over 65% fewer fraudulent returns in 1996 than during a comparable period in 1995. IRS believes this decrease is attributable to a 31% reduction in its fraud detection staff and the resulting underutilization of its electronic fraud detection system, which enhances the identification of fraudulent returns. However, IRS does not have the information it needs to verify that the decline was the result of staff reductions or by a general decline in the incidence of fraud. Given the decrease in the fraud detection staff, it is critically important for IRS to optimize the electronic controls that are intended to prevent the filing of fraudulent returns and maximize the effectiveness of available staff. Modernization is key to achieving both of these objectives. Turning now to the two new government-wide high-risk areas, IRS is vulnerable to problems in both. Related to information security, as the result of our work at IRS, we believe that the vulnerabilities of IRS's computer systems may affect the confidentiality and accuracy of taxpayer data and may allow unauthorized access, modification, or destruction of taxpayer information. IRS does not have a proactive information security group that systematically reviews the adequacy and consistency of security over IRS computer operations. In addition, computer security management has not completed a formal risk assessment of its systems to determine system sensitivity and vulnerability. As a result, IRS cannot effectively prevent or detect unauthorized browsing of taxpayer information by its employees and cannot assure that taxpayer data is not being improperly manipulated for personal gain. IRS needs to address its information security weaknesses on a continuing basis, impressing upon its senior managers the need to conduct regular systematic security reviews. The year 2000 problem at IRS is such that it could create a disruption of functions and services that could jeopardize all of IRS's tax processing systems. It could effectively halt the processing of tax returns and return-related information, the maintenance of taxpayer accounts, the assessment and collection of taxes, the recording of obligations and expenditures, and the disbursement of funds. To avoid the crippling effects of a multitude of computer systems simultaneously producing inaccurate and unreliable information, IRS must assign management and oversight responsibility within its senior executive corps, define the potential impact of such systems failure, and develop appropriate renovation strategies and contingency plans for its critical systems. Mr. Chairman, IRS and Congress face many challenges in moving the nation's tax system into the next millennium. The funding limits and program trade-offs faced by IRS in fiscal year 1997 and anticipated for fiscal year 1998 are likely to continue for the foreseeable future. The administration's out-year projections actually reflect a decline in IRS funding when inflation is considered. 
At the same time, IRS is faced with competing demands and pressure from external stakeholders, including Congress, to improve its operations and resolve longstanding concerns. In recent years, Congress, including a big role played by this committee, has put in place a statutory framework for helping Congress and the executive branch make the difficult trade-offs that the current budget re environment demands. This framework includes the Chief Financial Officers Act, the Clinger Cohen Act, and GPRA. GPRA requires each agency to develop a strategic plan that lays out its mission, long-term goals, and strategies for achieving those goals. GPRA requires agencies to consult with Congress, as you noted, as they develop their strategic plans. For IRS, these consultations provide an important opportunity for Congress, IRS, and Treasury to work together to ensure that IRS's mission is focused, goals are specific and results-oriented, and strategies and funding expectations are appropriate and reasonable. The consultations may prove difficult as they are likely to underscore the competing and conflicting goals of IRS programs, as well as the sometimes different expectations of the numerous parties involved. In summary, Mr. Chairman, for years IRS has struggled to collect the nation's tax revenues using outdated processes and technology. To address its high-risk problem areas, IRS needs an implementation strategy for modernizing its systems that includes developing cost-benefit analyses and reasonable estimates of the time frames and resources required. Above all, IRS management needs to sustain an agency-wide commitment to solving the agency's high-risk problems. That concludes my statement. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, I, I thank you for that excellent statement and the uh, really fine work that your staff has done over the years. And uh, it certainly is reflected in your statement, which is put in the record uh, the minute we introduce you. Uh, Dr. Stillman, any comment you want to make? No separate comment, sir. Okay. We thank you. I'm now going to yield 10 minutes to the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Sununu, to question the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank you very much for your testimony and uh, don't know quite where to begin given the, uh, the litany or the length of the issues uh, that you've raised uh, and that were originally raised with the, uh, the high risk series in which you've done such a, a fine job of following uh, the implementation of uh, some of the original recommendations and some of the newer recommendations as well. Uh, it is a source of frustration to me that uh, a number of the problems that you cite uh, particularly those in important areas of uh, fraud detection and uh, recovering collection, uh, collectibles are areas where, uh, given the reputation and, in fact, the, uh, um, the implementation of what many feel are intrusive and, and, and aggressive uh, uh, attitude on behalf of or on the part of people at the IRS, uh, despite that intrusiveness, it seems that uh, the area of collections and of fraud detection and of uh, ensuring high rates of compliance uh, have not been very successful. Uh, you raised a number of uh, obviously very important and critical areas. What I would like to do is uh, to, uh, try and focus on a, just a couple of those areas, uh, specifically the collections and the fraud detection. And I apologize. Uh, for any uh, repetition that might occur here, but I think that there are certain areas that are worth emphasizing and uh, that I would like you to go into a little bit more detail, if at all possible. Um, speaking about the receivables backlog and the collection of overdue receivables, could you talk a little bit more about the, uh, the scope of the backlog and what its age characteristics are, uh, just a little bit, uh, and uh, specifically speak about the um, the collections of uh, del delinquent receivables. Uh, your uh, report shows that delinquent collections have increased somewhat from 95 to 96 um, by uh, 15 or 20 percent. And I'd like to know uh, why, if, there are any, uh, if there's any reason for optimism uh, for the increase in collection of overdue receivables and how uh, the collection rate compares to what historic success rates have been. Congressman Sununu, the uh, accounts receivables problem at IRS is one that we've been concerned about since we initially issued the high risk series early in the 1990s. And there are a multitude of things that contribute to the problem. 
Right now, IRS is sitting with just over $200 billion in gross accounts receivables. But that number reflects not only the amount that are what we call financial receivables or receivables that we acknowledge or do the government, but also compliance receivables, which are in our nomenclature place markers for actions IRS has taken regarding monies that may or may not be owed the government. When you get down to the amount of money that IRS believes or estimates is actually collectible out of that, we're talking under $50 billion, still a substantial amount of uh, funds. Problems that IRS has faced in addressing the receivables problems run across the full gamut of its operations, from inaccurate data that's entered in when a return is processed that then turns into a receivable that's inaccurate on the record, to having problems with the, the age of the receivables, which is a big issue in terms of their collectability. Right now, it can take IRS two to five years after the filing date of a return before an additional assessment because of its enforcement programs is actually posted to its books. Well, in our society, as mobile as it is today, two to five years is a very long time in terms of finding the taxpayer, you know, having a corporation that may now be defunct, and being able to actually collect that money. And that's one of the reasons why we believe very firmly that IRS needs to modernize the systems that support the collection of its receivables, one, so that we know more about how effective specific programs are. We don't collect very good data right now on what works in particular cases. And we also need to understand more about how we can get these receivables on the books earlier when the accounts are newer, when the uh, private debt collectors tell us the success rate for actually getting the money in the bank is much higher. But all of that takes a comprehensive look at the causes and the underlying problems behind the receivables and the development of a strategy to both modernize the systems and the processes that support receivables and bring in new ways of doing business to collect the money that is truly due the government. Do you mean to suggest that the IRS doesn't actually know why the uh, uh, collection of delinquent receivables increased from 95 to 96? We have some general ideas, or IRS has some general ideas in terms of specific programs that took place, but they are more estimates than numbers that can be readily validated. And so while we, we have a sense of what's bringing money in, for example, sending notices out earlier and being able to contact the taxpayer uh, more quickly, it's hard to be precise about how effective that particular effort is and how that effort would compare to other alternatives in terms of picking the most efficient way to increase collections. And explain for me what the difference is between the $50 billion that you earmark as collectible receivables and the $200 billion figure that the IRS currently has logged in as accounts receivable? Well, the number is actually under $50 billion. I, I can't recall right off the top of my head what this year's number is, but it's uh, the difference between the two numbers is the $200 billion is the gross receivables, and that includes everything that's in there that may be a compliance assessment, like I said, uh, as well as a financial assessment. Is a compliance assessment, is that a euphemism for a fine? No, 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 no. A compliance assessment, for example, is if you did not file a tax return and I did a substitute for return and I determined based on information that was available that you owed a certain amount of money and I could not contact you or you did not respond, IRS has the ability to go ahead and assess that money while pursuing the taxpayer to determine how much is actually due. When the return is actually filed, that number may be reduced to even zero or the taxpayer may even need a refund. But based on the information that IRS has available to it at the time, it appears to be a receivable. But once you take that, the, the appliance receivables out of there, then you get down to the financial receivables, only a portion of which are actually perceived to be collectible. And collect non-collectible receivables could be from uh, defunct corporations, deceased taxpayers, hardship cases, but money that right now we don't believe is within the, uh, the purview of the collection efforts to actually go after. Uh, on the, uh, the issue of uh, older uh, receivables, um, to what extent is it realistic to keep the uh, older receivables on the books? And, uh, and in answering the same question, could you talk a little bit about the uh, success or, or lack of success 
uh, that the agency, uh, uh, the IRS has received or seen in the use of subcontractors to, uh, to handle some of the debt collection? The question of how long we keep the receivables on the book is one that has been discussed extensively. Right now, IRS keeps the receivables on the books until the expiration of the 10-year statutory uh, statute of limitations. I think it's less important whether they keep the number on the book, more important that we understand how much of the money is affected by the 10-year uh, statute of limitations, how much of the money is actually collectible. And that's why the, the financial accounting systems become so important, because those systems properly done would allow us to know how much of this money ages into different categories, so that we would be able to determine, in terms of reporting those numbers out to the Congress and the public, what boxes they fall into and which ones are reasonable to collect. And uh, how about the effectiveness of some of the um, trial programs using subcontractors? And what are the privacy issues there? How can we be sure that uh, to the extent that the IRS relies on private debt collection uh, organizations that the, the privacy of taxpayers is respected? IRS is moving now into the second phase of the private debt collection initiative, the first years. And, and basically what we have discovered so far is not surprising, that private debt collectors are running into the same problems collecting IRS accounts. They're old, the people are difficult to find, that IRS employees are having. And that you know, improving the quality of the information in the accounts would not only enhance the ability of private collectors or subcontractors to collect the money, but would also help IRS employees be more productive. In terms of privacy, the same uh, taxpayer privacy requirements are imposed upon private debt collectors as are imposed upon uh, IRS employees. The taxpayer data is treated with the same level of confidentiality. One of the things that IRS is tracking and is very interested in, as is the Congress, is whether there are any problems that evolve because of the use of, of subcontractors or private debt collectors in this experiment. And I think that's a very critical policy issue that's before the Congress, is how far do we want to go in making taxpayer data available to individual contractors doing you know, a variety of different tasks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're quite welcome. I now recognize the ranking uh, Democrat on the committee, Ms. Maloney of New York. And I, I might add, the quorum was established before <laughs> Mr. Sununu spoke, and we're delighted to have the gentlewoman from New York. Well, on my uh, flight here from New York this morning, several constituents mentioned a program that was on television last night, I didn't see it, that talked about uh, United States taxpayers using um, uh, tax havens and as a means of hiding their income, Grand Cayman um, accounts. It also noted that the IRS was cutting back its overseas uh, unit that tracks uh, monies uh, that uh, may be moving overseas that should be taxed in the United States. I, I would like your comments on that. And, and uh, the Grand Cayman accounts, what are you doing to track these accounts? Um, could you talk briefly about your overseas unit and operation in uh, tracking um, monies that should be coming to the United States Treasury? Congressman Maloney, um, Deputy Commissioner Dolan, who's going to be testifying shortly, would be in a better position to talk about any shifts that IRS is making in terms of the resources addressing issues associated with taxpayers uh, moving money overseas. What I can say is that the movement of money out of this country into tax havens in other parts of the world is not a new a phenomenon, but it is one that we have increasing concern about because of the use of the Internet and the difficulties that cyberspace present us in terms of, of audit trails and being able to track where the money was actually generated or the revenue was generated and where it should properly be uh, taxed. I know IRS is aware of these issues, but I am not familiar right now with either the program that you spoke of or specifically what is happening with them in terms of staffing of those operations. Well, in terms of staffing, uh, you're, you have been cut. Uh, you testified 10,000 employees, is that correct? IRS has been cut about 10,000 employees over the past two years. And what does is, what is that impact on your ability to um, collect 
delinquent taxes and to collect uh, taxes owed the, the, the public, the Treasury of the United States? When we GAO have looked at the IRS budget cuts, one of the okay. things that we have been very concerned about, as I alluded to in my uh, formal statement, is the cut in the resources that have gone to things such as the questionable refund program, the program that's designed to identify filing fraud. And we believe, or IRS reports, that part of the reason that the number of fraudulent returns is that has been identified as down is because of staffing cuts in that program. Mm -hmm. I think both of these areas, both the international issues as well as the filing fraud issues and the uh, staffing cuts that have taken place, identify some of the very marked challenges that IRS is going to be facing over the next years as we move beyond the year 2000 mm -hmm. in providing not only the compliance resources that are needed to effectively implement the programs, but also to increase the quality of customer service that's provided to the taxpayer. Um, there's been a considerable discussion about the appropriateness of the IRS uh, using random audits to update its audit programs, and what is GAO's position on, on, on these audits? Or have you looked at it? We have looked at IRS audits, uh, random audits, in terms of the research audits to identify taxpayer noncompliance. And we believe that IRS needs a tool to identify noncompliance that may be occurring in places that we're not expecting it. And we have not found a comprehensive approach, uh, a replacement for the Taxpayer Compliance Measurement Program, which was supposed to take place in 1994, but which has been indefinitely delayed. One of the concerns that we have is that unless we come up with a new way of measuring compliance and measuring compliance in such a fashion that we can identify it in places where we're not expecting it, that we will undermine the total compliance of the tax system. I know that IRS is working on this and recently has uh, accepted a report from Price Waterhouse on measuring of taxpayer compliance. And where random audits will fit into that entire program in the future, I'm not sure. There, there have been uh, a number of proposals on restructuring the IRS, mm -hmm. um, and the GAO in a series of, of your own audits have, have pointed out uh, uh, failures in management. Um, some people have argued moving the IRS out of the Treasury, and some have argued that Treasury should have more of an oversight of the IRS. The IRS has always been sort of a completely independent unit, um, and when you talk to Treasury, they say, well, we you know, they're, they're totally separate. What, what is your um, feeling on the structure of the, uh, of the IRS? Should there be uh, more of an oversight by Treasury? Should it be moved someplace else? Should, what are your feelings about uh, uh, correcting, really, some of the uh, faults, actually, that your agency, GAO, has pointed out in, in uh, failure to meet management goals? Congresswoman Maloney, there are a variety of public policy issues that have to be addressed when we look at the structure of the IRS. And there is a tension between the independence that we want in this country for the nation's tax collector to have, to be free from political uh, intrusion or political persuasion, and the need for proper agency management and oversight. We believe that Treasury's new role or more enhanced role in terms of providing oversight of IRS is necessary right now in light of the management difficulties and the longstanding problems and their magnitude. However, providing proper management oversight and remaining outside of the, uh, keeping the independence of the IRS is, is a critical dilemma that the Congress faces and would need to be considered regardless of what the structure is. But also, regardless of what the structure is, key to making improvements at the IRS is using the tools that we have to hold IRS accountable for the monies that it spends and the effectiveness of its programs. And we think that the three acts that Congress has passed over the past few years, Klinger, Cohen, GPRA, and the CFO Act, provide us with... I want to interrupt there. Sure. Some people don't know what GPRA I'm is. I'm sorry, the, the Government, Government Performance and, and Results, Results Act, Act. Probably one of the most significant acts Absolutely. ever passed by Congress. Absolutely. An act which, if properly implemented, will give us the ability to track the effectiveness of various programs within the IRS in achieving mission goals and determine which ones work the best. Mm -hmm. So I think all of those things need to remain in place and be applicable to whatever structure 
is used to collect the nation's taxes. In your testimony, you recommended that Congress should consider not funding either the $131 million uh, for system development or the $1 billion capital account. At the same time, Mr. T Tobias testi testified about an experiment in compliance uh, funding that returned considerably more uh, than, than projected. Would you recommend that the system development and capital fund money be invested in compliance efforts? I think those are basically two different decisions. Our concerns with the system development request is that the money has not been properly justified, that the methodology used to develop the numbers is not adequate, and we have no guarantee that this money will be spent any better than the money that has been spent in the past in terms of systems development. And that's basically why we recommended that Congress consider not funding that money. In terms of the compliance initiative money that was funded in 1995, there are a couple of concerns that we would have about future appropriations. One is that the money be fenced, and by that I mean that IRS be required to spend the money for the specific compliance initiative programs that, I, that the Congress charters. In the past, before 1995, when it was not fenced, we found that the money generally was not spent on improving compliance. In 1995, that was not the case. We are currently looking at the numbers and the methodology used to derive those numbers in terms of the return on that investment. And it appears that IRS did bring in more money than they expected to in the first year of that compliance, the first and only year of that compliance program. We need assurances that the money, if properly spent, we will also be able to account, however, for the additional revenues that come in. And that's been a problem from a data perspective historically. One of your earlier audits uh, criticized the, the three billion spent by the IRS supposedly on modernizing its computers. And uh, I, your report showed that they had virtually nothing to show for it. Do you have any other comments on, on their efforts to modernize and update their computer technology and uh, the specific audit that I mentioned that came out, I believe it was last year, from GAO? Let me turn that question to Dr. Stillman, our chief scientist at GAO. The basic problem with the three or three and a half billion dollars expended on TSM is that IRS cannot demonstrate benefits or return on investment uh, that exceed the $3.5 billion. Um, uh, we have reported that they cannot do that and that in investments in the future they should be uh, much more careful um, to make their investments, to analyze their investments consistent with GPRA and Klinger Cohen to avoid repetition of that kind of thing. So in other words, you're saying they wasted the $3.5 billion? Wasted in general is a poorly defined term, and IRS themselves have testified mm -hmm. that they feel that uh, what they would call waste is somewhere in the area of four to five hundred million. Um, the key question, I think, is can they demonstrate can they demonstrate benefit in excess of three point five billion expended? And in fact, they cannot come close to demonstrating benefit anywhere near three point five billion expended. So they cannot run their own computer system? They have done a poor job developing new computer systems. Okay, what would you suggest we do? What do you suggest we do? Do we have uh, another agency come in and develop their computer system? I mean, what, what are your suggestions? Actually, we've made a series, well over a dozen specific recommendations for what IRS can do better in the future. Among the things they can do better in the future, first, they can formulate a comprehensive business strategy so that they know how they want to do business better in the future, how they would like to do their business in the future, which uh, will involve relying more on electronic submissions of returns and less on paper. First, they have to know what they're doing. Second, they have to correct underlying infrastructure weaknesses. They do not now have disciplined processes in place for developing software and systems or for acquiring software and systems. And until they do, they should not be in the business of doing either to any major degree. Um, they should also be careful to measure progress on an incremental basis so that we don't have the big bang theory that Mike Dolan has testified in the past has not worked for him and in all fairness has not worked for any agency and has not worked in private industry. Well, that's a, a very heavy criticism 
of, of the IRS. Um, one area where they appear to have made some progress is an area where the chairman and I have um, worked very hard in the last year, and that is in collecting delinquent taxes, that which is owed the American people. And apparently their collection is up 17 percent from last year. They had 30 billion delinquent. Now they are at 25 billion delinquent. Why do you say, why do you think they have improved? Why have they improved that collection? Do you think? It's hard to say specifically what actions led to what level of improvement. But there are a number of things that IRS has done over the past year, including earlier intervention in the collection of accounts that has, appears to have enhanced the collections, changes, making notices more readable so that when people get them, they understand better what the government needs from them and expects from them. Uh, moving different people, people into different, more productive types of positions within IRS so that the taxpayers can be contacted in the most efficient fashion. All of those things have provided incremental levels of improvement to the collection of tax debts, but they have not solved the underlying problems. I thank the gentlewoman from New York. Uh, let me just uh, pursue a few closing questions here. Uh, one, I'm curious the degree to which GAO as the Congress's program and financial auditor uh, have looked at the pilot programs that were issued by IRS in terms of the collection of debt. Uh, the Debt Collection Act that I and Mrs. Maloney authored last session applies to everybody but IRS. Uh, we're awaiting the Ways and Means Committee action in this area. But it was IRS that got me into this when I saw they'd written off, in, quo in quotes, over $100 billion beginning first under the Bush administration, but accelerate accelerating greatly under the Clinton administration. Then they said, well, we've got another $64 billion that uh, we think we can collect. What I'm curious is, what's your assessment of the pilot projects, some of which I hear offered five-year-old debt to collect. Now, what that me meant to me, as I heard about that, if that's correct, and I wonder if you could verify it, is that IRS doesn't want the private debt collectors to succeed, because five-year-old debt is almost impossible for everybody in the world to collect. People are dead, they've forgotten it's a debt, and so forth. So what's the reading of GAO on looking at those pilot programs? We are in kind of in the middle of looking at the pilot programs. IRS did face some difficulties initially in getting the cases out to the debt collectors that were selected as the subcontractors for that program. When the uh, cases were sent out, they were old. Some of them were five years old. There's no question about that. I would hesitate to say that that was because IRS didn't want the pilot to succeed, in part because those are the same cases that are being sent out to IRS collectors. The other thing with the pilot program is that it is limited to the uh, private collectors contacting or attempting to locate the uh, taxpayer, attempting to explain their uh, obligations to them and asking them to contact IRS. So there are a variety of things ongoing. We expect to be finished early in the summer in terms of what we're doing for Ways and Means and to have a better sense of where we need to go on the second phase, the second $13 million part of the uh, private debt collection program. And again, my understanding is that IRS is beginning to look at what sort of mid-course corrections need to be made to get a better sense from the program on whether private debt collectors can be effectively used and what we can learn from them. I gather from your testimony that they seem to have solved the problem of confidentiality when they put these pilots together. Is that correct? I think that's an open issue. The same requirements that face IRS employees are imposed upon the private collectors. Uh, there have been firewalls built around the information, et cetera, but one of the things that is being tracked is whether there are difficulties with maintaining the privacy. I would think, and I told this to the commissioner when I listened to all the confidentiality nonsense, which I thought it was just a red herring to avoid collecting debt. Uh, what seems to me is you give them the amount owed and the address and say, go to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hadn't seen in the IRS's own collection efforts. 
and it seems to me if they want to collect in the IRS, they ought to be moving on these debts within 30 days of the delinquency when it's discovered. Mm -hmm. And uh, because pretty soon people forget it's a debt. Students certainly do. Uh, they think it's uh, the loan has become a grant. And it seems to me the sensitivity of this is simply to let them have the address, let them have the amount. If they got a quibble, let them quibble with IRS, not the debt collector. But the debt collector ought to work out a deal to get something they aren't getting. And when they let it run up to $100 billion, that's a national scandal as far as I'm concerned. And then they aren't organized. And do you detect any way now that these pilots will make some sense in terms of getting them to organize, to collect debt, and work cooperatively with private debt collectors, as the case may be? I think we, IRS, will learn a variety of things from the pilot in terms of how to use more modern processes and operations in order to uh, track down and find taxpayers who owe the government money. The pilot will not, however, address the underlying problems that lead to it being three to five years after the date of the tax return being filed before the additional assessment is imposed. So even if IRS were to move out within 30 days of the delinquency being assessed, even at that point we are three to five years beyond the time when the taxpayer incurred the liability. And so it's five years at the start of all this, in is some what cases, you're saying. Yes. Yeah. And at that point, we've also had interest building up on the amount owed. And, but the, the private debt collection pilot will not address those issues beyond, I suspect, confirming our sense already that the older the debt, the more difficult it is to collect. Yeah. Has the IRS got any way of tracking people that declare bankruptcy to avoid payment of taxes? Has G GAO ever looked at that? Issue. It has been a number of years since we've looked at IRS's efforts to track people that are in bankruptcy, and that would okay. have been long before the surge that we've seen in bankruptcies through the 80s and into the early 90s. It is an area of concern for any debt collector, for any right. person who is owed money, the number of bankruptcies that are out there, uh, but I can't testify at this point on the current effectiveness of IRS programs in that area. Let me move to the year 2000 issue, which you brought up, and as you know, this committee started the interest in it. Uh, has GAO looked at the degree to which IRS is trying to solve this? And in looking at IRS, are they behind most other agencies in this regard? We know that Social Security started in 1989 on its own initiative without congressional prodding. And we know that a lot of agencies, such as energy and transportation, in the case of transportation, everyone but the Federal Highway Administration didn't really know it was a problem. And uh, they had started also in 1989, but their management system didn't get that information to the top, so the Secretary knew it and knew it was a department-wide problem. So uh, do you have any reading as to the degree where IRS stands in marching toward the solution before there's a lot of chaos on midnight and uh, of the year 2000. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not in a position to tell you where IRS stands as it compares to other federal agencies in dealing with the year 2000 problem. We are looking at IRS's efforts, and I am in a position to tell you that the problem is serious. IRS is in the assessment phase of looking at its systems. It has divided its various systems into the tiers, uh, with the tier one being the largest, biggest systems. And I think they are well aware of the magnitude of the challenge that they face in bringing very large, very fragile, very old systems into compliance by the year 2000. They have laid out an aggressive, an aggressive schedule for bringing the tier one or the major tax processing systems into compliance. And we would expect that they would begin testing that sometime in the year 1999 in order to determine whether we're going to be successful. But I don't think it's an issue that anybody can relax their vigilance on until we know the systems have been made compliant. IRS also faces a problem in having systems that cannot be made compliant, that are so old they're going to have to be replaced. And in dealing with some of the issues that Dr. Stillman discussed with systems acquisition, systems development, those are going to have to be addressed in the year 2000 process as well as any modernization effort. Mm -hmm. 
As you look across the federal government in terms of how automation is effectively implemented, uh, to what extent have you found the trade-off of personnel positions to incremental moves toward automation? And is IRS ahead or behind in that issue? Do they simply come up and want more money isolated solely for automation? Or do they do what the rest of us have done when we headed long in, uh, large organizations? And that was simply try to work an incremental trade-off and make some progress uh, in that area. And what's your sense of that? Successful modernization of the IRS systems will allow them to do more with fewer people. The trade-offs that have been made so far have been limited in part because we have not successfully modernized the systems in terms of being able to deliver the additional capability that will make uh, IRS employees more productive, have better access to information, do things more electronically as opposed to by paper. This year, IRS's budget request included both additional money for systems modernization as well as additional funds for new positions in terms of returns processing. So while there have been some trade-offs made, obviously there have been requests for additional funds in both areas. One last question. I will pursue the rest uh, with IRS and we'll also send you some questions. But one question for the record. In testimony before this committee at its March 1996 hearing, a witness reported that the Internal Revenue Source Service is not logging, tracking, or able to report the number, location, or dollar value of the liens they may have placed and they're not redeeming those properties with IRS liens against them when they are foreclosed on by a bank, a savings and loan, or an investor. And it's been estimated that over $100 billion in these liens have been written off and another $60 billion is ready to be abandoned. The witness said that in her experience, the IRS has failed to redeem approximately 99% of these properties and therefore to recover billions of dollars in Treasury tax dollars. Instead, the IRS property tax liens are simply allowed to expire and disappear. What do you suggest should be done to restore confidence in the IRS's ability to effectively manage the program? And has that come within GAO's review? Mr. Chairman, we are currently in the process of looking at the issue of liens for the Senate Finance Committee, and we have just begun this work. And I can tell you there are problems in identifying all of the liens that IRS has either imposed or has standing in the courts against taxpayers. Some of the questions that were raised in the statement made by the witness have been raised by others, especially as it relates to downsizing, restructuring of IRS activities and concerns whether this will impact on their ability to release liens, et cetera. Those are all issues that we will be looking at as we pursue this over the next few months for Senate Finance. Right now, I'm not in a position to comment on that particular statement. I understand the IRS has no nationwide database of liens. That is, that is my correct? understanding as well. Okay. Uh, well, I thank you. We will have a number of questions, if you don't mind answering them for Be the record. To. We'll put them in place at this point. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome to the committee a member of the full committee, Mr. Sanders of Vermont, uh, who uh, is asked to sit with us and without objection. Uh, we'll uh, even permit Mr. Sanders to ask an occasional question. Bernie. Thank, you thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the major concern that I have in terms of the process today is to try to understand the impact of the new reorganization on New England and specifically on Vermont because we're hearing a whole lot of concerns about that. Before we get to that, I would like to ask uh, uh, Ms. Willis and Dr. Stillman a question and, and see if they can give us uh, a response from GAO's perspective. Uh, yesterday there was an article in the Boston Globe, and let me just quote uh, from it, and I would appreciate it if you might comment. This is what the Globe writes. Quote, because of a shift in IRS priorities, audit rates for high-income taxpayers have plummeted in recent years, while the rate for people earning less than $25,000 has more than doubled. And then later on they say, quote, only a few years ago, wealthy taxpayers in any part of the country were far more likely to be audited than they are today. In 1988, the IRS audited better than 11 percent of returns filed by people with $100,000 or more in income. By 1995, the audit rate had fallen sharply to less than 3 percent. 
Meanwhile, the audit rate doubled for people with income under $25,000, going from around 1% of returns in 1988 to 2% in 1995, end of quote. Uh, my understanding is that in terms of higher income people and corporate America, there are tens and tens of billions of dollars of unpaid taxes out there. So my question from the GAO perspective is, and I wonder if you've done any research on this, why is it that there seems to be a tremendous interest in going after and auditing people who are making less than $25,000 a year, but not quite that interest in going after millionaires and large corporations? Congressman Sanders, we issued a report last year that looked at IRS audit rates and coverage. And it is true that IRS audit rates have fallen. And we did find some of the same trend lines that you mentioned. But I'd like to explain a couple of things that we found that affected those lines. One is because of reduced resources, the audit rate overall declines and continues to decline. But IRS has also been doing a variety of audits as it relates to the earned income credit, which are typically the people underneath the $25,000 threshold that you're talking about. And those audits have been put in place because of concerns of the Congress, GAO, and others regarding the high level of reported noncompliance within that credit. And so as those programs have taken off, as IRS has attempted to identify where the noncompliance and the level of noncompliance within the earned income credit is, that has put additional resources and additional emphasis on taxpayers in the under $25,000 income range. So I think when you combine the cut in resources that reduce the overall audit rate and add to that the increases in the earned income credit, you see those, those trend lines for higher income are right. audited less often, lower income more often. So basically you're confirming what, what the article indicated, that there is more of an emphasis on going after lower income people who might take advantage of the EITC, but less interest in going after upper income people. If, I mean, if the argument is there's simply not resources available, one might ask if, as I have heard, maybe you might want to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I have heard that there is an estimate that there's over $100 billion a year in unpaid taxes from corporate America and from wealthy individuals. Some might want to know why there is not an emphasis of going after those folks while we're going after people making less than 25000 Well, there is an emphasis in terms of the corporate side. The numbers that you typically see cited address individual audit rates as opposed to corporate audit rates. And IRS has an ongoing corporate audit rate or corporate audit program for the largest corporations in this country, the, the 1,700 largest. So the numbers that I'm talking about are for individual taxpayers. And I wouldn't suggest that our work shows that IRS has an interest in going after low income more than high income, but rather because of different drivers behind the compliance programs as well as the resources that are available that when you look at the numbers, the trends on one are down, the trends on one are up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, I thank you very much for your response, but would, would simply suggest that I think uh, that in a time uh, when over the last 15 or 20 years this country has given huge tax breaks, lower taxes for upper income people and large corporations, there is something I think wrong in the priorities of the IRS that they seem to be focusing on lower income people and ignoring the tens of billions of dollars in potential tax revenue that we can bring in from upper income people and large corporations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank you. Uh, you've raised an interesting question. I think we'll pursue a lot of it with the IRS management, but uh, does it, uh, as I read your t full testimony and GAO's work in this area, uh, does it mean essentially that there is a greater percentage of fraud in the earned income tax credit program based on what we know, or is that level of fraud, and as I saw it, it seemed to be just dependence added to the form uh, to get more money under the earned income tax credit. Is that about the same level uh, of fraud as you find in the upper income? And I, I say that for this reason, that it seems to me the people that pay the taxes in this com uh, country are the middle class uh, in the aggregate, because there's more of the middle class than there is of the so-called corporate uh, barons. And uh, when you get an earned income tax credit, which has millions of people eligible, that aggregate is going to amount up to quite a bit of money if there's substantial fraud. Mm -hmm. Has GAO looked at the relative fraud potential of these various programs? Yes, we have, and we reported in 1994 and 1995 
to the Senate Finance Committee, I think, a couple of interesting statistics. When you look at the amount of, of noncompliance, and I say noncompliance because we don't always know when there's a problem with a return, especially an earned income credit return, whether it's intentional fraud or unintentional noncompliance. The earned income credit can be an extremely complicated credit, especially for the group of taxpayers that it's targeted toward. But when you look at the noncompliance rate for the earned income credit, it is not higher than the reported noncompliance rate, for example, for uh, sole proprietors. And it is much lower than if you look at the noncompliance rate for people that we call informal suppliers or, you know, the people who sell wood in your neighborhood who essentially work the cash economy. So from a tax program perspective, there are other programs that have equally concerning areas of noncompliance. Part of the problem with the earned income credit in terms of compliance is that it is a refundable credit, and so that it is not covered by money that is withheld or is uh, simply not paid to the government. It is money that actually flows out of the government treasury as a supplement to the income of these families. And so we are concerned about the noncompliance and also concerned about how we can efficiently reduce that noncompliance. And IRS has done a number of things that have been effective, especially as it relates to the uh, electronically filed returns and moving more into the paper returns and identifying people with dependents or who don't have the proper filing status. I think it's more important that we focus across the board on all of the areas of noncompliance and ways that either IRS administratively or Congress statutorily can improve compliance. Well, I thank you very much uh, for that statement, and we'll follow up with some more specific questions. You've done a fine job, and we thank you very much for appearing. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Next panel, panel two, will please come forward. We have Shelley Davis, former IRS historian, Sheldon Cohen, IRS commissioner during the Johnson administration, fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, and Robert Tobias, the president of the National Treasury Employees Union. If you'd uh, raise your right hand and uh, do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give this subcommittee is the truth, uh, the, nothing but the truth, and the whole truth? Uh, yes. All right. All three have affirmed. And we welcome you. And we'll start uh, just on the way it is on the roster. Uh, Shelley Davis, uh, Ms. Davis, the former IRS historian, if you'd summarize your statement in about 10 minutes, we won't hold you completely to it. But as you know, your full text goes in this point in the record. But we'd like to hear the basic thrust of it for about 10 minutes. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm pleased to uh, be here before you today as you attempt to understand and ultimately improve the IRS. Um, as the only person to ever serve as the historian for the IRS, I would like to focus my testimony on the subject with which I am most familiar, the evolution and history of the IRS. And as, as a historian, I have to admit to a professional bias to the need to understand the past in order to move intelligently into the future. Uh, my testimony before you will consist primarily of two parts, and I'll try to um, give you your history lesson as quickly as possible. Um, the first part, um, I'll discuss what I call flashpoints of IRS history, those events which had a defining influence on the tax collector. And then I will briefly outline the congressional response to some of these flashpoints. The first flashpoint in IRS recent history is 1952. Forty-five years ago, on March 15, 1952, the IRS was officially reorganized into the structure with which we are familiar today. This was not a reorganization dreamed up by the IRS. Rather, the 1952 reorganization was forced upon a reluctant IRS by President Truman and a Congress fed up after years of reports of problems with the tax collector, pledges from the IRS to clean up its act, and a glaring failure of the agency to be able to implement change by itself. Recent cries from current Commissioner Margaret Milner Richardson at the IRS that the IRS is undergoing some of the greatest attacks in its history today, um, in my opinion, demonstrate the lack of awareness of its own history, which the IRS reflects. Um, because in reality, compared to the outcry 
that faced the IRS in 1952. The IRS today is really having a, a picnic in the park, at least so far. Um, Moving forward to the second flashpoint requires a jump of 20 years to 1973. That was the year in June of 1973 when White House counsel John Dean revealed that the White House had developed what he called an enemies list. Dean also revealed that the IRS had set up a small secret staff to collect information on dissidents and malcontents in American society. In the media frenzy that followed these revelations, these two references became forever jumbled in the American psyche, and the enemies list became forever linked with the IRS, with the general assumption being that the IRS was guilty of auditing and, and chasing after President Nixon's enemies. The problem was that the IRS wasn't guilty. At least they weren't guilty of auditing Nixon's enemies. The bigger problem, though, for the IRS at least, was that the IRS was guilty of assembling its own enemies list, far more substantial and far more dangerous than anything President Nixon ever dreamed of. So in mid-1973, the IRS had a big problem. It knew that it hadn't audited Nixon, its, Nixon's enemies, but it couldn't very well go out waving the flag with this pronouncement because it knew that its own internal actions were far more dangerous and its own list was far more extensive than Nixon's list. Just a matter of perspective, the IRS list had over 11,000 taxpayer names on it. Um, all the various compilations of Nixon's enemies list have around maybe 600 at the most names. So what did the IRS do in 1973? It remained mute. The IRS learned that by simply keeping its mouth shut, by biding its time, that events would eventually calm down and normalcy would resume. The third flashpoint of recent IRS history jumps forward a decade to 1985, the year of the great IRS meltdown with, with which we've all heard so much recently. Um, this was the year the IRS installed new computer hardware and software in its 10 processing centers around the country. When the new systems had trouble keeping up with the uh, sheer workload of tax processing, the IRS workload became quickly overwhelmed and the, the story was flooded with stories of IRS employees stuffing tax returns down toilets and into ceiling tiles and throwing them in waste baskets just to get them off their desks in front of them. The final flashpoint I want to address is actually more of a fizzle than a flash, but it's important nonetheless. The final example demonstrates how the lessons the IRS took from these earlier flashpoints have succeeded, that its best defense is often silence, that the waiting game is usually the winning strategy for the IRS. The flashpoint fizzle that I refer to happened between 1989 and 1982, or 1992 and involves the investigations launched by former Congressman Doug Bernard into allegations of misconduct by senior level IRS executives. In all, during this three years of hearings, Bernard revealed some very serious abuses on the part of at least 25 top-level IRS executives. But of these 25 cases, only one individual received even a modicum of punishment, that being a 10-day suspension. Um, the pain of that suspension being lessened when this man's fellow executives took up a collection to reimburse him for his lost pay for that period of suspension. The value of the lessons learned from the previous flashpoints became immutable truths for the IRS after the Bernard hearings. By verbally pledging to clean up its act, by shifting the players to avoid accountability, by remaining mute, the IRS emerged from the most painful public hearings into its integrity since the 1952 hearings with nary a scratch. And now, just for a moment, about the congressional response to these various flashpoints. As I already pointed out, in 1952, Congress acted by reforming and restructuring the IRS. This is the only time in the recent history of the IRS that Congress has taken decisive action which resulted in significant change inside the tax collector. And what of the Watergate years? Well, because the IRS was successful in hiding the real story of what was going on, Congress fixed the wrong problem. In 1976, asserting that the IRS had become what was called a lending library of tax returns to the White House, Congress moved to tighten the privacy, re privacy restrictions on tax return information, enacting the most restrictive provisions in the history of the tax code to access to tax information. The result of this 
was that Congress actually handed the IRS the best defensive weapon it has ever had. By continually citing restrictions on access to taxpayer information, the IRS has perfected the art of blunting criticism and deflecting blame. Rather than putting real restraints on the IRS, Congress inadvertently gave the IRS even more power to operate without accountability. And what of 1985, the great tax meltdown? Well, there's nothing like cries from constituents to bring about change. After the dust settled, Congress essentially gave the IRS a blank checkbook in 1985 and told the agency to fix its computers forthwith. Well, we've all heard the results of, of that. And what about the flashpoint fizzle of Congressman Bernard's hearings, which finally concluded in 1992? Nothing. Congress did not enact a single reform or take any action at all at the end of three years of very painful investigations by Congressman Bernard Fizzle. So the circle begun in 1952 was now complete 40 years later. From an era when Congress was appalled at ethical problems inside the IRS and took decisive action to an era when Congress was deaf and dumb to revelations of unethical behavior and mismanagement inside the tax collector, the IRS completed its learning curve that the best defense is to promise that studies will be made, pledge to fix existing problems, and convince Congress to leave it untouched. The IRS executive cadre of today is filled with employees who are steeped in the culture of secrecy, who believe that running the tax system is too important a job to be left in the hands of anyone but a member of their private club, who have learned to wait out every storm, rearranging the deck chairs after every public revelation of mismanagement or financial bungling. Um, I'll digress for a minute and talk about how um, the IRS news story of the week, which is browsing um, by IRS employees, shows that once again, I believe that Congress is attacking the wrong problem. Rather than focusing on low-level, poorly trained, in many cases not very highly educated IRS employees, the more important question is what is being done about the IRS executives who promised, who pledged to Congress four years ago that they would implement a no-tolerance policy for browsing when this issue was raised. Accountability on the part of IRS executives is where Congress needs to be looking. The browsing story ultimately plays directly into the hands of the IRS, which wants to be able to proudly stand tall and proclaim they are protecting taxpayers, all the while skirting the more important issue of accountability. The IRS simply doesn't hold the members of its own executive club accountable for their actions. By drumming out an occasional low-level employee while protecting its top-level bureaucrats, the IRS has once again succeeded in duping Congress and the American taxpaying public. So what can be done? Well, I believe that, that we and, and you, members of Congress, can no longer wait for the IRS to fix its own problems. With historical parallels to 1952, IRS plans and reorganizations of recent years have not corrected the problems that we all know are there. I believe that Congress should look to 1952 for suggestions on where to go from here. The problem today, like that of 1952, is one of leadership. And not just leadership at the very top of the IRS in the position of the commissioner, but leadership throughout the entrenched secret society of IRS executives. Congress excised the problem 45 years ago by replacing both the commissioner and the entire top tier of IRS executives. Today, I believe that same type of action is necessary to recreate the IRS into the premier organization that it has been and that it can be again in the future. Thank you. We thank you for that uh, marvelous statement. In the question period, uh, we will get into it more and your own experiences with IRS as historian. Uh, is your book out yet? Yeah, sure. It is? It should okay. be in any bookstore. Okay. I want to know that. What's the title of it? Unbridled Power, Inside Unbridled the Secret Power. Culture of the IRS. You and I have had somewhat similar titles. I had a book called Unused Power, the Work of the Senate Committee on Appropriations. Better unused than unbridled, so uh, 
<laughs> okay, Bernie, what's yours? Is yours out? <laughs> it is coming up. But <laughs> Okay, uh, that's very fine. And uh, let me now go to former Commissioner Sheldon Cohen, uh, who was Commissioner of the IRS during the Johnson administration, now a fellow of that distinguished body known as the National Academy of Public Administration. Thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I should start by saying that the views I express today are my own. They're not attributable to my law firm, or, nor to the National Academy, which did send me here or request that I come here, but did not review what I'm going to say. Uh, I'll try to summarize. I I'm somewhat familiar with the King and King hearings because I was there. I, I was recruited to the IRS in the fall of 1952, just as the reorganization was in full swing. So I, I do uh, subscribe to some of what Ms. Davis has said, but not all. I would. Uh, admonish the committee that a page of history is worth a volume of logic, and so you need to look to where you've been to see where you're going. Um, and uh, there are rec some suggestions I've heard recently that we should repoliticalize the IRS. That is, we need more political responsiveness. <clears throat> That's the lesson we learned <coughs> excuse me, in 1952 that we don't want. And so I would uh, go through this. By, uh, by saying that when I came to the tax law, the Internal Revenue Code was as thick as my thumb, and the regulations were somewhat smaller than that. Uh, I measured them on my desk the other day when I prepared my statement, and the Internal Revenue Code is now about four and a half pages long, uh, thick, and uh, the regulations is now, are now in six volumes rather than one, and they measure something over eight, nine and a half inches wide. That's not a choosing of the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, uh, that's the choosing of the complexity of the society and the re feeling of the Congress that it has to re respond to that complexity in some way or another. And so the complexity of the rules does create many of the problems, not all, but many of the problems that we're, we're dealing with. Um, you have alluded to the fact that, uh, that earlier in the uh, in its history back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, through the 70s, the Internal Revenue Service was thought of as one of the best administrative agencies in the government. And that is so. I should say that as a preface to that, or a, or a footnote to that, that the cost of collection in the United States is the lowest cost of the developed world. So we're doing something right. There's many things we're doing wrong, but we're doing something right. Uh, one of the problems that we find, and I think the, over, the uh, Restructuring Commission has alluded to this publicly a number of times, is that the Congress never saw a problem which it couldn't address with a tax solution. Um, I can draft. I, I, my first job was as a legislative draft, but I can draft any appropriation bill as a tax law. And you have done it in spades over the years, not this group, of course, but the Congress over the last 35 or 40 years that I've been watching it has put in the earned income tax credit, which we were talking about 10 minutes ago, is a welfare provision that happens to be in the Internal Revenue Code. It doesn't belong there. And so the Internal Revenue Service catches the heat for administering a provision that should be in the welfare system. Um, and, and we could go on with, uh, I mean, I can spend the rest of the day discussing chapter and verse of other illustrations of that. Um, change itself is complex. One of the simplest things I could advise you, and I've seen other tax experts up here try to say the same thing, is leave it alone for three to five years and we'd all get used to it. At least we'd learn the rules. We wouldn't be dealing with a constant change of rules, which makes it very difficult. I mean, last year, as I say in the statement, I was delivered 700 pages of explanation and law, and it was a quiet year. And I'm I'm presumed. I did read it all. I did read it all. Uh, but I don't think that you want to impose on the Revenue Service the jobs of collecting school loans, of finding wayward parents or fathers or mothers, or going out and dealing with organized crime. Each one of these issues is probably meritorious, but each one adds to the complexity of the management of the job. And I don't think anybody up here including the oversight committees, has taken the time to say, what is the overall effect of each of these piling on of layers of, of work? And, and of course, we see now that result. We are looking at that result right now. 
we're looking at the result of a deteriorating system come about by the layering on of additional responsibilities. Stability of workforce. Um, you can't give them five or 10,000 people today so that you can score it for budgetary purposes. Take it away next year and not have a deleterious effect. I mean, that is a negative, not a positive effect on the, on the organization. You've, you've geared up to hiring them, you've trained them, and then they're gone. And that's just de demoralizing. Uh, the, uh, the cuts that come, when, when you say cut the Internal Revenue Service, well, you can't cut producing returns, you can't cut processing returns, you can't cut depositing checks, well, where does a cut come from? It comes from training. Well, that makes the workforce less responsive. It comes from auditing. It comes from collection. It comes from answering telephone. I mean, somebody, the commissioner and, and the staff, have to decide what are we going to cut. And what you cut really is the most productive work you do. Uh, and so, so it is that you will see the deleterious effects when you have these kinds of cuts. Uh, I was lucky. We were living in different times, and I didn't have to face many of those problems, although I did face some of them. There were some freezes and those kinds of things when I was there. One of the things that was just alluded to was the audit rate. The audit rate was something on the order of between 4 and 5 percent when I was commissioner. The audit rate is presently, they say, about a percent and a half or a percent and six, but really it's less than 1 percent because they've redefined what an audit is in order to get the numbers up. Well. You all drive as I drive out on the suburban highways. If we see a policeman once in a while, we tend to stay close to the speed limit. If we don't ever see a traffic policeman, we all bear a little heavily on the accelerator. And so it is with taxpayers. I think everybody who's ever worked in this business knows that. And so that deter de deteriorating revenue, excuse me, audit rate is just not acceptable. I don't think in this kind of a system. Now, I, I talk about the fact that we put in the computer system. We were lucky. The Congress didn't know what we were doing, and by the time anybody looked at it, it worked. It took a long time. The system that I put in in the middle 60s was designed in 59, 60, and 61 by my predecessor. What happens is, of course, a commissioner puts in the program that's designed by his or her predecessor and is responsible for planning for the for the uh, programs that are going to be put in by the next one. And one of the things that's attrited during the last 10 or 12 years and attrited seriously is the IRS's planning staff. The IRS had a premier planning and research staff. And of course, when you start cutting back on their resources, they start cutting back and, they say, and somebody says that's fat. Well, it goes and then goes your capability of producing a good plan, as Ms. Willis said, for your computer system. That computer system that was put in in the mid-60s was designed mostly in-house, although some outhouse work, but mostly in-house by two or three, a small group, about eight or ten people. One of the problems we have, of course, is, is, is uh, I lived in a period of uh, can-do government. Today we have government being dumped on. And one of the problems I see is you would never see a commercial company, General Motors chairman would never say, we make lousy cars, although a few years ago they did. He would say, we make great cars, we're going to make better ones if we all work together. Unfortunately, we've had dumping on government. Government is the source of every problem in the world. Well, the government has a lot of problems, but it also has a lot of solutions. And the revenue system, as I said in my paper, does produce more revenue at a lower cost than any system in the world and is the model of most of the rest of the world. So it can be improved. It can be improved dramatically, but we've got to recognize that. Uh, Ms. Davis is right. The Revenue Service was not responsive to the enemies list. I represented a taxpayer who was audited under TCMP during Watergate. He was one of the top ten persons on the list, on the enemies list. And there were no problems. He never had a serious problem. Uh, TCMP is 
an essential ingredient. Ms. Willis avoided answering your question, but there is no substitute at the moment. If there is no substitute, then we need a sample program. If nobody's got a better one, it would be a shame to let this one die. And as that data that is used to develop that program withers because of age, it becomes useless. The program actually is designed to help taxpayers, not to harm, harm them. Because when we started TCMP, the audit rate, about 50 percent of individual audits resulted in no change. By the time we finished, I think last year I saw the data for it was about 15 or 60 percent no change. That is, the computer selected the return, it looked like it had an, audit, an error, it didn't. That's a big change from 50 percent down to about 15 percent. Without that kind of data, you're just by guessing by God. And when you go into individual selection techniques, it uses up the most important resource you've got, people. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of this because you will, I'm sure, read it if you'd like. Uh, I will talk about a couple of the ideas that have been suggested. They're not new. The idea of separating the IRS from Treasury has been suggested as long ago as 30, 35 years. I think it's a bad idea. If I were Secretary of Treasury, I'd find it abhorrent that the most important revenue function of the government does not, it does not report to me. Now, that's not to say that the Secretary of Treasury ought to have much in the terms of management. The commissioner is the equivalent of an undersecretary and ought to be left alone and ought to be responsive for doing a job. But there are tax issue, policy issues and there are monetary and fiscal issues involved in the creation and the operation of a tax system and the secretary <coughs> should have a voice in those if need be. Uh, the idea of a board of directors doesn't sit well with, with me and Mr. Chairman, you, you indicated that you want a manager for the, for the Commissioner of IRS. Yes, you do. You want a good manager. But whether that manager is a CPA or a lawyer or a businessman is a hard question to answer because, I, as I say in the statement, I wrote speeches when I was a kid for the last Commissioner of Internal Revenue who was a non-technician. He happened to be a CPA, but he happened to be a manager. He, had, he knew nothing about the tax system. He was a non-technician. And he would become before congressional committees or he would go out and make a speech and he would answer a question and he would answer it logically. Well, the tax system isn't necessarily logic. The tax system is what the Congress says it is. And then we would have to explain why he was wrong. Well, we would never admit he was wrong, why, why he was misquoted or, 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 or... So there are problems. If you had a technician sitting here today and you asked him a technical a non-technician and you asked him a technical question he's got that he or she's got to have enough nerve to say I don't know the answer to that question Miss Jones or Mr. Brown will answer it. it's a little hard in this context so you have to think you may get what you wish for and in this world and that's 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 kind of tough um, I think, I think that, that's a pretty good summary. I, I'd say that, as I indicated to you, if you had a perfect tax plan right now, if you had a system that you thought was perfect for the Internal Revenue Service and you began to put it in today, it would take you six or seven years to get it in. So don't have an illusion that, that somebody's going to come up in the next six months with the magic bullet that's going to make this thing work and work beautifully. It's going to take a lot of people and a lot of money and a lot of planning. And one of the notes I handed Ms. Willis is, is she ducks your question. You asked her what kind of a system she would put in and she doesn't know. Well, they don't know either. They ought to know. They ought to be thinking about it. But they need enough money to think about it. And you ought to hold them closely and make them produce the thing. But you've got to give them enough money to plan it because it isn't going to produce itself. And nobody outside the Revenue Service, without the cooperation of the Revenue Service, can produce that plan because nobody knows what they need to do but that. 
We thank you very much for that statement. I'm sure we're going to be pursuing a number of questions with all of you, but the last witness on this particular panel is Robert Tobias, President of the National Treasury Employees Union. Mr. Tobias. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify. As all of us in this room know, the IRS has been bashed and battered by some members of Congress, by the press and the public. Now, some of that criticism is justified, but much of the criticism ignores the IRS successes, and there are many. IRS collected $1.36 trillion in revenues in fiscal year 96. It's projected to to collect $1.47 trillion in fiscal year 97 and projects it will collect $1.57 trillion in fiscal year 98. In addition, in fiscal year 96, IRS collected $38 billion through its enforcement efforts. Revenue voluntarily paid and revenue from enforcement actions headed up through fiscal year 1996. And in response, to some of the questions Congressman Sununu raised, the IRS knows why those enforcement dollars are up. They're up because of the compliance initiative that was initiated by Congress in 1995, which allowed for more people to be involved in collecting taxes and in auditing taxes. The audit rate went up from 1.02 percent to 1.6 percent and the number of people actively engaged in reducing the accounts receivable led to collecting uh, in the first year of the compliance effort $800 million, notwithstanding the fact that the IRS promised $300 million in the first year. Now, Congress killed that initiative in 1996, and I believe that you're going to see a reduction in the enforcement revenue as a result. Now, in contrast, the cost of collecting revenue is headed down. In fiscal year 1997, the cost to collect $100 of, of revenue was, excuse me, in 92 was 60 cents, 50 cents in 97, and it's projected to be 47 cents in 98, or an 18 percent drop in four years. Most democracies spend $1.25 to $1.70 per $100 of revenue collected. No tax collection agency anywhere comes close, much less matches the IRS cost per dollar of revenue raised. While costs are declining, work is increasing. More returns are processed, more refunds distributed, and more telephone calls answered. In the 1996 filing season, the IRS answered only 9 million calls of the 42.3 million made. Using roughly the same period, January 1 through February 24, 97, the IRS answered 11.3 million calls, or 2.3 million more, of the 21.6 million calls attempted. It's also important to note that fewer calls are being made this year, primarily because of IRS attempts to reduce unnecessary notices, which in turn stimulate telephone calls. More revenue, more work performed, and decreased cost should be the basis for at least mild applause from those who would evaluate the Internal Revenue Service based on a comparison to the private sector. Despite these successes, the conflicting pressures imposed by Congress, the administration, and the federal deficit threaten to exert too costly a burden upon the IRS and in turn the compliant taxpayer. Left unresolved, these, pres these pressures will result in lower levels of compliance, greater costs per unit of revenues collected, and a further erosion in public confidence in the fairness of our tax administration system. As such, the Congress and the administration must immediately forge a new consensus on the mission of the Internal Revenue Service. I believe that the IRS must make it a priority to provide the taxpayers who already comply or those who are seeking to comply with the services they need. At the same time, the IRS must increase enforcement activity upon the non-compliant to restore the confidence of the already compliant taxpayers in the system. The non-compliant have the right to be, to be treated with respect, but the compliant taxpayers have a right to expect the IRS to enforce the law against the non-compliant. The compliant have a right not to expect to subsidize the non-compliant taxpayers in this country. Now, the IRS management's proposed field reduction in force is a prime example of its moving away from its obligation to provide customer services to compliant taxpayers. 
The RIF plan will reduce customer services to those trying to comply, reduce net revenues, and cause several hundred low-paid, mostly female employees, to lose their jobs. As the subcommittee is aware, the IRS scrapped the plans jointly developed to implement the field reorganization. The regional and IRS headquarters offices had approved these carefully laid, these crafted plans, but unilaterally rejected them and directed that a RIF of 2,371 employees would occur and 1,312 employees would be hired doing the same work in new locations. The IRS con continues to assert that the proposed RIF, quote, has not and will not adversely impact service to taxpayers. I emphatically disagree with that. From May 1996 to April 14, 1997, the IRS failed to create a plan to perform work with 1,059 fewer employees. New, no new work processes have been created and no new technology has been introduced. There is no question that taxpayers will have less service under the plan the IRS is proposing to implement. The IRS has no data and no plan to refute the logical inference that 1,012 new inexperienced employees cannot provide the same level of customer service as 2,371 experienced employees. There can be no question that taxpayers, compliant taxpayers, and those seeking to be compliant will not receive the service they need or deserve. And the IRS cannot absorb the downsizing by detailing experienced employees or creating dual position descriptions to solve the problem. As was pointed out, the Internal Revenue Service has lost some 10,000 employees over the last two years. I identify in my testimony the specific kinds of actions that taxpayers will suffer as a result of this. Uh, delays in the release of tax liens, increased interest costs to taxpayers from delays in processing liens, late case closure resulting in an increase in unwarranted notice of, of deficiencies, increased errors by inexperienced replacements, reduced problem resolution service, reduced taxpayer education programs to help targeted groups, reduced information systems personnel to maintain computer and telephone systems, and fewer individuals to help ta taxpayers interested in electronic filing. And to bring this home, Mr. Chairman, consider what would happen to those who cannot get timely assistance from the IRS. Your constituent may be an elderly and infirm widow who has just discovered she has a tax lien on her house. She needs to sell her home to move into a nursing home. Her health is failing rapidly. She promptly satisfies the lien, but she cannot complete the sale until the IRS clears the lien. Instead of clearing the lien in three days, as is the current practice, there are IRS locations today where 30 days will pass before her lien will be released. Her buyer will lose patience, the sale will fall through, she will, without doubt, be damaged. While this story is fictional, it illustrates what will happen to countless real people, real taxpayers. Each person affected could needlessly suffer personal hardship and monetary damages resulting directly from the failure of the IRS to provide prompt, and accurate customer service. Mr. Chairman, NTU fully supported the IRS announcement that it would reduce the number of districts from 63 to 33 and the number of regions from 7 to 4. However, we cannot support the proposed RIF of these employees. NTU urges Congress to prevent the IRS's current proposed method of implementing its reorganization plan. If the ultimate goal of the field reorganization, as stated in the IRS congressional testimony presented in March, on March 18, 1997, is to ensure, quote, that salary dollars can be spent instead on frontline operations, close quote, NTU asserts that Congress should transfer the $97 million in fiscal year 1997 appropriations, which will not be spent as planned, on information services downsizing and several tax systems modernization programs that have been canceled and use that money to provide more frontline compliance and customer service positions. In addition, Congress could get the IRS back on the right track and enhance confidence in the tax systems by restoring funding for more vigorous compliance activities. While wage earners are 95 percent compliant and 75 percent of taxpayers take a standard deduction, the latest calculation in 1992 of the compliance gap showed $129 billion in taxes went unpaid. 
$22 billion more than the federal deficit of $107 billion last year. Congress conducted an experiment in 1995 which proved the IRS could reduce the noncompliant population and increase revenue for deficit reduction. The IRS geared up, hired, and trained people. The IRS promised, as I mentioned, $300 million in marginal revenue and produced $833 million in marginal revenue. Congress withdrew its support for the initiative to save money for other purposes, and the administration has since not re renewed its funding request. NTU believes that it is pennywise and pound foolish to forego the added revenues which can be collected through investment in compliance activity. Congress should, could use these added revenues to further realize customer service objectives and reduce the federal deficit. Lastly, NTU believes that Congress must consider alternative funding mechanisms to provide the IRS with adequate and stable funding resources. Current budget rules do not provide sufficient reliability to allow the IRS to function at its most e efficient state. For example, when Congress decided to end the 1995 compliance initiative, the budget rules scored the $400 million cut in salaries and expenses as a savings and ignored the $9 billion in revenue that the initiative would have brought in over the next five years. These rules presumably are intended to conserve of fiscal resources, yet our common sense tells us they do just the opposite. NTU urges Congress to rethink these rules as they apply to the IRS. Thank you again, Chairman Horn, for the opportunity to express NTEU's views on the management issues confronting the IRS today. I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Mr. Horn. I, I thank you very much for your testimony. It's been most helpful. Yes. Ms. Davis mentioned 6103, and I, I think I, I need to tell the committee, Section 6103 was amended in 76 at the request of the Senate Government Operations Committee. Uh, and you want to translate 6103? 6103 is, uh, the, privacy, is the privacy section of the code. It requires uh, confidentiality. And the Administrative Conference of the United States was requested to make a study. The chairman of the Administrative Conference of the United States at that time was Nino Scalia. Excuse me, Antonin Scalia, the Supreme Court Justice. And I was the co-chair. So it was done for a valid purpose. It may not have been done right. And one can argue about the public policy. But it was done carefully by a careful committee. Let me just make another translation for those who read this transcript. We heard a lot about the TCMP. What it translates to in day-to-day -day English is the Taxpayer Compliance Measurement Program, in case anyone's wondering about that. I now yield uh, five minutes to Mr. Davis, the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just start off with you. What's the morale like among the rank and file employees? There's been a lot of bashing of the IRS. And is, is this filtered down to the employee uh, level at this point, uh, you've, and then with the planned rifts and everything else. Could you give us a reading on that? Well, it is. Uh, the, the morale of the Internal Revenue Service employees is very low, um, certainly in connection with the planned RIF, uh, certainly in connection with the bashing that they have taken over the last two years particularly. And that translates not only into um, problems in the workplace, but also, I think, a lack of respect by taxpayers toward the IRS. Um, and the legitimate actions that IRS takes. I mean, all too often, the Internal Revenue Service employees are blamed for the laws that uh, you all create. Yeah, that's uh, so often the case in this. I, I was interested in your comments on the RIF. Um, the IRS is, thinks that it won't adversely impact services uh, to taxpayers. You obviously take a different view on this. Um, does any of you have any evidence that uh, women and minorities aren't going to be disproportionately treated? Well, we've been trying to get that information okay. uh, from the IRS since May of last year, and we still haven't been able to get the information. Um, the anecdotal evidence is, yes, they will be adversely impacted, and perhaps illegally so. But the kinds of, work, the kinds of jobs that are adversely impacted are primarily based on the anecdotal evidence. and. Um, my travels around the country are women and minorities. Uh, if e either of the other panelists have any thoughts on that? No. no. Let me ask you about uh, officer making a local telephone call is preferable to calling a 1 800 uh, number. Is it more productive, you think, in terms of customer satisfaction or comfort 
in terms of calling up? Have you, any studies on this, or what can you? Well, certainly the Internal Revenue Service can't supply uh, enough people in every single office to satisfy walk-ins, and um, a 1-800 number is critically important. But it's also critically important to have someone in a location to release a lien or to answer a question or to take a check when someone does walk in the office. So both are necessary. One can't um, be advanced to the exclusion of the other. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service has attempted to characterize this dispute in terms of taxpayer service, traditional 1-800 taxpayer service. I believe the issue is whether or not customer service, service to taxpayers in general, will decline with this proposed RIF. And I don't think that there is any question, there can be no doubt, uh, that this will occur. Uh, Senator Kerry uh, did some uh, hearings out in uh, Nebraska just last week where practitioners, IRS employees, and the public all came and testified that they were not receiving the service that they had received three months, six months, nine months ago. And I think you'll find that to be true across the country. You talked at length about the t just the release of liens and the widow who may need to release a lien and how difficult that may become when you're preparing. We heard from witnesses in a prior hearing that the IRS didn't do a very good job of working on taxpayer liens anyway. Do you have a different impression or do you, would you just say that if it didn't before, it's going to be worse under this? It's going to be worse. It's going to be worse in those districts, in those non-continuing districts, the districts who have been identified to be non-continuing districts. There, there used to be 63, now there are 33. There are 30 non-continuing districts. And uh, in those districts, there will be problems. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Davis, let me ask you, in, in your opinion, if the IRS contracted out for a new state-of-the-art computerized information system, with bells and whistles such uh, uh, with bells and whistles such as access and other security controls uh, had it installed and saw that it was working perfectly would that mean that congress gao the treasury the ig and all the other irs stakeholders could rely on the rs information from then on would the current staff be be capable of taking it from there and running with it i'm not sure i understand if you ha if you had the whole system up say you had a system that was up and working perfectly uh, could we then rely on the IRS information from then on, or do you think there are some other inherent problems in there that would need to uh, constant overview? Well, that's a really hard theoretical question to answer. I mean, I guess one thing that I'd like to say as far as contracting out a computer system, I know this isn't really what your question is getting at, is, is I don't believe that um, the, the confidentiality flags that get waved in the air every time the issue of contracting something out, you know, are really um, a severe problem to be concerned about. So I think you could, you could potentially even contract out the entire computer system as well as the operation of the computer system, and that may well be, you know, where the best answer lies. Um, I think that if the IRS had, was, had a completely wonderful new computer system placed in its hands. I think the vast majority of IRS employees who are out there across the country in the field offices running, you know, the computer systems processing the tax returns are doing the best job they possibly can. I think that, you know, that would be fine. I, as I said in my statement, I really believe that almost every problem that the IRS is saddled with today um, emanate from the headquarters of the IRS, from the executive. So um, I think if you put a new computer system in the hands of the IRS employees around the country, I think you know, you, you might very well have a much smoother running system. That's a good endorsement. I'm sure Mr. Tobias would agree the problems here aren't generated from the rank and file employees, and it's been management. They, they are not. They yeah. are not. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, any observations on that? Again, that's a little too simplistic. Um, if, if you had a perfect computer system and you'd never have one, never be perfect because the moment it's perfect the moment it, that's it, it's it's out of date as soon as you put it in so you can't you can't you can't stop you can't stop planning for tomorrow uh, because you've got things are going right today because that's a that's a recipe for disaster you're we're entitled to a, a fair trial in the United States we're not try, entitled to a perfect trial we're entitled to a fair tax system not a perfect tax system and so we've got a very good one we, we've got a lot of defects. There has been some managerial fall down, not to the extent Ms. Davis says. And, and so w you can't design this system 
with the thought that this is the last time you're going to design a system. That's, that's the problem. We, des we designed a system 30 years ago, which was a fine system. It is not a fine system today. Okay. Thank you. That's my time is up. I appreciate it, Mr. I thank uh, the gentleman and now yield five minutes to the ranking Democrat, Ms. Maloney of New York. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Cohen, you, you indicated in your testimony that the, the changing uh, laws, tax code laws, are, are a problem. Um, what do you suggest we do about it? Do you, do you suggest we have a two-year moratorium on changes in the tax code uh, uh, so I, that we... I do that, I do that with a, with a, it really as a joke. I, I think the Congress is like every other body in the United States. It needs an internal discipline also. The Revenue Service needs its internal discipline. You need an internal discipline here. And, and you need someone who's going to say, well, I, look, I'll give you an illustration. I used to say to the Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy, he was a close friend named Stanley Surrey. He was the premier tax lawyer in the United States, professor. And I said, Stanley, you understand it. I almost understand it. How in the world do I explain it to the rest of the people? And, and someone here has to say the same thing, that this is a good rule. It may be better than the existing rule, but it is an infinite. For example, the, the alternative minimum tax is a, is a rule that was enacted up here. Now, it seems to be the, the current kicking, kicking boy. Everybody is kicking the alternative minimum tax as being the most complex rule in the Internal Revenue Code. It is. What was it designed to do? It was designed to help the Congress avoid facing limitations on individual deductions, which together, when put together, gave some taxpayers an unusually large deduction and therefore pay no tax. So instead of addressing the problem directly, as it should have, the Congress said, let's take this pill. This pill is called the, uh, the alternative minimum tax. And at, that tax has been in here since 1968 or 69. And you diddled with it, but every time you diddled with it, you made it worse, not better. Well, what do you suggest we do about it? Do you suggest that uh, possibly we uh, informally have a collaboration with IRS professionals on what the consequences of certain tax changes have in the implementation? And really, I think it's a... It's a nice idea. I, I think I like it's that. a serious uh, suggestion that you, that you have on the constantly shifting tax policy is problematic not only for the IRS, but certainly for the American uh, businesses and certainly the trade of, of the world that we're involved in and the constant, uh, you know, we, we now have a certain uh, budget cycle. Maybe we should have a, a tax cycle of two years so that people have a chance to sort of understand the ramifications and that you are not constantly going into situations which you pointed out the IRS goes into one day they have a certain set of employees, the next day have, they have a certain set of employees. It's hard to plan, implement uh, with all these cutbacks. Uh, maybe we should have the same type of planning restrictions, not only on personnel to do the job, but on uh, uh, changes in policy so that the business community, the trade community, and the IRS professionals themselves could catch up with it. And also I wanted to uh, uh, very quickly throw in another question uh, in response to your testimony. You mentioned uh, we train them, we spend time with them, and then they leave. Why, why are they leaving? Uh, you were talking about the personnel. Let me, let me answer them in, 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 in order that you asked them. The chairman of the Ways and Means Committee many years ago was a fellow by the name of Wilbur Mills, who was a, a Harvard Law School graduate and a first-rate technician, and he had an interest in the technical aspects of the tax law. Most Congress people don't have that. They, you know, they, they're, they're interested in the policy, but they're not interested in the technical aspects. Somebody here has to ask the question once in a while, what, what does this do to the tax law? Wilbur had a, had a plan and at one time. It was never implemented because he couldn't get everybody to go along with it, was that he would study, he would divide the code into, into sections, and he would study over a period of four, five, six years. Each year he would study different elements and try to improve them. Now, that would take up the full power of the Ways and Means Committee, would be able to do all the other things it does. But at the end of a four or five year period, you'd have a much better law. Now, that, that's why it never got done, because it would have diverted them from doing the little diddles that help each one of the members of Congress do what they would like to do. Um, 
One of the things I've suggested, and I've heard other people suggest on occasion, is that each time somebody suggests a, a, an improvement or a change in the Internal Revenue Code, that they re be required to submit to you how it would be reflected on a return. Because that would be very telling. To s where's, the re where's the space on the return? And also, what would the instructions look like? And also, and Mr. Cohen, you could add to that thought having the IRS comment on how they would implement it. Well, you don't ever ask them. That's, that's again, when, if, if I, used to, I used to be a staff person, so I drafted legislation, and it was rare. Now, Mr. Mills would invite me in in private. I would come in and tell him what I thought, but it would be rare that I testified in public hearing because I wasn't invited. Tax policy wasn't my, wasn't my bag. So, I mean, it can be done because Mr. Mills used to do it. Um, but both of those ideas would help. Now, why do people leave? Government is unattractive now. When, when, I, was, when I was commissioner, it, it didn't have anything to do with me being commissioner, President Johnson had passed a comparability act, and government salaries were within about 80, 85 percent of going rate in the, in the, in the area. Uh, the work was good, so good people came and they enjoyed it. Uh, as I indicated to you, I had uh, 15 top people on my staff, and only two of those people changed in a five-year period of time. Uh, you've got a 50 percent turnover in less than that right now. Uh, that's because the pay isn't up to, up to snuff and because they get, beat around, they get beat around the head fairly often. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, our, our nation was, was founded on a tax revolt, <coughs> and certainly no one wants a meddlesome uh, big brother uh, approach in our taxes, but we should at least demand from an important government agency that they be competent and efficient. Uh, they should certainly be as competent and efficient as uh, American Express or Citicorp, yet by all accounts, they are not. And Citicorp I picks its clients. The IRS doesn't pick its clients. <laughs> well, um, God, that, that's true, but certainly the, the management not, not just the clients, just I mean, the you know, management. The, well, but the client, you see, the client is involuntarily dealing. I, if I go to the bank to borrow money or to, to, to have a credit card arrangement, it's benefiting me. If I go to the IRS to pay them taxes, it's hurting me. I mean, that, the definition of a tax is that it's an enforced exaction of the state. That's the definition of a tax. Yet, by all accounts, um, the GAO reports repeatedly, your testimony and others, uh, there has been uh, uh, shall we say, not, uh, not, uh, not especially efficient um, or uh, consistent management or effective management at, at the R IRS. And I'd like to come back to your testimony. I'm out of time, he's telling me. I, I, I thank the gentlewoman from New York, uh, the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Sununu. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tobias, uh, we've all uh, by now read a number of accounts about uh, information systems and in computers, what has, uh, what has been spent and, and, and how effective they've been. My perspective is that um, uh, while computers or good information system is important, um, technology is uh, a poor substitute for good people and, and good training. Uh, but having said that, I'd like to hear your perspective on um, what opportunity there is to improve the tools and equipment that's, uh, that's in the hands of uh, you know, the, the people on the front lines. Um, what kind of changes or modifications uh, and opportunity for improvement is there? What would uh, certainly the members of, of your uh, uh, employment group like, like to see in, as we go about trying to uh, repair and, and amend some of the uh, technology uh, um, implementation plans that we have? Well, I, I would start at the most basic uh, tool, and that's the human resource tool. Um, the amount of dollars spent on basic training and advanced training in the IRS, I believe, was cut uh, $21 million um, from uh, in, in 1996. Um, so continuing education was not part of the 1996 IRS effort because Congress cut funds and training was cut. So I think basic training is critically <coughs> important. Um, for the customer service representative that Congresswoman Maloney was uh, speaking of just a moment ago, uh, 
they need the tool to be able to have the return come up on their screen so that they can provide instantaneous response to the question that the task taxpayer asks. And the tax system's modernization effort was to provide that kind of information, to integrate the databases so that questions could be answered and adjustments made at the time the first telephone call is made. Um, those, those kinds of tools to customer service representatives would, in my view, significantly enhance the credibility of the IRS and provide the information compliant taxpayers need to remain compliant. Where in your f uh, mind has the, have the shortcomings been, though, in trying to implement uh, some of these modernization programs? I mean, there have been uh, uh, clearly shortcomings, clearly failures in uh, I don't know if it's a question of setting expectations that are too high with regard to what technology can do or a failure, a failure at the management level or failure in not being inclusive enough and, and taking into consideration the people at the customer service level and the design of the systems. Where in your mind has the failure been? I think the IRS um, bit off more than it could chew. I think that uh, the IRS recognized that uh, the technologies of, of the 60s and 70s wasn't going to be good enough for the technology of the 90s. Um, it had tried, like private sector corporations, on several occasions to introduce new technology every time it would get up to the brink of implementation. Congress pulled the plug on the funding. And so there came to be a consensus that the IRS had to have new technology, and the IRS, I believe, mentality was we have to go for broke because we don't know how long this funding will last. There was no idea of stable funding. So I believe the IRS tried to do too much. It did not integrate the, sep the 23 separate um, programs and the several millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars it was projected to spend. It didn't have an infrastructure. It didn't have an architecture. And as a result, um, it was not managed properly. Uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, maintaining the line of inquiry and technology, you talked about the system uh, designed in the in 60 and 61 and then put into place uh, when you were uh, a commissioner. Uh, to what extent is that um, venerable computer system still uh, utilized in course, the activity well, today? Unfortunately, much of it's still utilized. I mean, the, the, some of the hardware has changed, but basically the basic thrust of the program is the same. And technology, of course, we had no random access. If, if we wanted to find Sheldon Cohen's tax return, we had to go to a roll of tape and just run it through there until it got to that to my social security number and it would stop and produce my information. There was no random access. I mean, uh, my little personal computer's got more random access than their big computer down at Martinsburg. I mean, we put in three, uh, IBM 360s and 370s, which were state-of-the-art mid-60s. Uh, absolutely top line. I doubt if you, the, the Congress would let us do it if they'd known what we were doing. I mean, we were going for broke because we knew, knew we had one shot to put it in. And, John, and Mr. Tobias is absolutely right. That is, the, you, you have this instant, instant gratification mentality. Uh, this is a long program. As I say, if, if you knew what you wanted, I've talked to Mr. Gross, and I've had, we had lunch just a few weeks ago. And if you had a program today that was as good as you could get, close to perfect, you, you were talking about six, seven years to put it in. So, and you're talking about two or three years at least to design it. So you're talking seven, eight year program. Um, and you need to design, I mean, we, life was simpler then. It was designed in 59. We began installation in 65, 64, 65. So, you know, it was a, but, but the machines were simpler. The, the context was simpler. We only had, and, and by the way, the first thing we ha had to learn then was that the, we had to have our paper system working as good as it could possibly work before we went to computers. You can't leapfrog. So you need to take the present system, make it work as perfectly as you can make it, and then move into the new system. You can't leapfrog. And they're trying to leapfrog two or three generations. That's awful hard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you very much, Mr. Sununu. Uh, let me pursue a few questions with each of you. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you noticed uh, in your remarks that uh, citizens are entitled to a fair trial, and you're a lawyer by background. A lot of citizens and a lot of members of Congress say, if that's true, why don't we switch the burden of proof to the client, the taxpayer, and away from the IRS? Right, right now, the IRS does not have to prove its case. The taxpayer has to prove the case. Why isn't that changed? Because you would make the IRS more intrusive if you did it. If you think about the system as it exists, we're dealing in the civil system, not a criminal system. In a criminal system, the IRS has the burden of proof. In a civil system, the proponent of the idea has the burden of proof. The plaintiff in a, in a civil trial, has a, the, he's proponent, proposing the idea, he has the burden of proof. Why? Because he has all the information. Why, if, if I have to prove my medical deductions, I have them. I have all the doctor bills. I have all my checks. I can do it. The IRS doesn't have it. All they can say is, we don't see from your return that your medical deductions look right. Please show them to us. That's why I have the burden of proof. And so it is with business records or anything else. If we want to make audits more intrusive, then the IRS will have to demand all the records. They'll become much more intrusive. They'll be less productive. Uh, but everybody forgets that I have the tax records. They are in my possession. I ought to produce them if I'm making an assertion. Now, there are problems that come up around the edges. I'm not saying that there aren't taxpayers who don't feel abused, and a few of them are right. But the question is, which of those techniques will burden more of the taxpayers? And clearly, the burden of proof on the government would burden more taxpayers because the government then is in a position of saying, produce all your records. They'll have to subpoena them or summons them or use some technique to make you bring them in in order to be able to see whether they've got a case or not. Mr. Tobias, you have any comment on that question? Um, only that we have a voluntary tax system. People say what it is they owe and what deductions they're going to claim. And I, w I would just mirror what uh, Mr. Cohen said. Uh, if I'm a taxpayer, I have the information, and therefore I should have the burden in a voluntary tax system of showing why I owe um, $10 instead of 20 Ms. Davis, do you have any comments on this part, uh, well, point, yeah, uh, based I, I, on your review of IRS yeah, and having very worked quickly, there? Yeah, um, so I wasn't involved in, in, you know, personal audits or anything, but I've had many conversations with IRS executives and employees. Believe it or not, many of them still do talk to me very openly about things. And one of the things that actually a recently retired IRS executive pointed out to me um, was that that he believed that the IRS approaches virtually every taxpayer as though they are cheating on their taxes. You know, if they can cheat, they will cheat. If they can scam, they will scam. And they're going to go into an audit situation with that kind of negative attitude rather than approaching taxpayers as though they're doing everything they possibly can to comply with this outrageously complex system that you know we've all been saddled with. And so I think um, it's probably more of an, an attitude question than anything. Um, and if you changed even that cultural perspective on the part of the IRS, I suppose you, you, know, the, you could even accomplish what you want to accomplish by changing the burden of proof, by changing the way in which taxpayers are approached on the initial instance by the IRS that we are trying to comply. I filed my tax return as a self-employed person for the first time this year, and I've never seen such a mind-boggling mess of paperwork in contrast to the simple returns I used to have. I did suggest about three years ago, when I, four years ago when I first came here, that uh, we ought to pass a resolution of the Congress that we all, as members, have to sit on the floor of the House on April 15th, no tax attorneys, no tax accountants <laughs> with us, and we have to fill out our own form. I suspect there'd be great reform that followed that immediately, uh, but we've now turned it over for $750 or $1,000 to an accountant, and we don't worry, we just sign, and then you worry and hope it's right. But uh, let me ask you, Mr. Tobias, uh, you're familiar with the Debt Collection Act that we authored last year, Mrs. Yes, Maloney and myself. Uh, uh, 
elements of that are now before the uh, special subcommittee of Ways and Means as to applying that act to IRS. It's the only part of the federal government that it's not been applied to because we have the uh, uh, interest of Ways and Means, which I thoroughly understand, to have jurisdiction over that. On the other hand, we've lost a year. Now, does uh, the uh, union that you are president of have any feelings on that legislation, one way or the other? I, I believe, uh, Mr. Chairman, that contracting out the collection of taxes to the private sector is unwise uh, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, I believe that the Internal Revenue Service employees can and do and will be proven that they collect dollars owed faster, better, and cheaper than the private sector and that the answer to reducing the accounts receivable inventory is to provide the IRS resources they need to collect more taxes, not contract it out to the private sector. I believe that collecting taxes is an inherent governmental function not to be contracted out. Second, I think that there are issues of privacy about um, providing information to the private sector. As you were speaking this morning, in the experiment, um, the, the, those who are involved in this experiment receive only a name and the amount owed. But what the IRS is finding is that these people can't find taxpayers any easier than the IRS can, and that in, in some substantial number of cases, the amount owed is disputed, which means that they have to hand it back to the IRS to, to, to close the case or to do a part pay agreement. So I think there is inherent inefficiency, and I believe, based on that 1995 tax compliance initiative, the IRS proved that it could collect money if it were given resources. I don't think the private sector is the answer in this case. When you've got 100,000-plus employees and you let the debts run up to $100 billion-plus, why can't 100,000 employees be so organized that they reduce that debt. That is a scandal of IRS to let $100 billion accumulate well, in lost revenue. I think that uh, perhaps it's a scandal for the IRS, but I think Congress shares some of that responsibility. Um, when the IRS proves that with more resources, it can decrease that, uh, those accounts receivable, and then Congress says, uh, sorry, I'm not going to fund it in 1996. Even though you're successful in 1995, I think Congress bears some of that responsibility. And it's easy to say, well, there are 100,000 people, and why can't they collect the money? But those 100,000 people are also processing uh, 200 million returns, issuing, um, I don't know, I think it's $190 billion in tax refunds. Um, Many so they're not all involved in, collect in, in, in accounts receivable. So when the IRS had 5,000 more people focused on that effort, they produced. Well, I'm willing to give them the first 30 days, but if they can't produce, I think it ought to be turned over to somebody that can produce. I I'll now take that yield. 30 days. Yeah. I'll take that 30 days with the resources, yeah. and whatever test you want to, whatever test you want to create, I think will beat who's ever at the starting line. Yeah, I think uh, the fact is that uh, with 100,000 people, and I don't blame you, I blame management for not organizing themselves so they can make that 30-day call. They haven't been making the 30-day calls. Well, and what? pretty soon people forget, as I said earlier, that it's a, a debt. They think, gee, it's a grant. They've forgotten me. It's my money. Well, you know, one of the problems that the IRS had to decide, for example, just this year was well, we don't have enough money to do um, audits of uh, small businesses, and so what we're going to, and at the same time, increase the level of access for compliant taxpayers, so we're going to move people who otherwise do audits to answering telephones. Well, as a result, my prediction is there's going to be less revenue in fiscal year 97 than projected. There will be more happy, compliant taxpayers who everyone speculates but no one can prove will pay more taxes because they know what it is they owe and will, you know, will pay that money. 
But in the meantime, I, I project that, it, that there will be a hearing next year about why the IRS has less enforcement revenue in 97 than they did in 96. And when the answer is, well, we answered mo more phones, Congress won't be satisfied with that. Well, no one's talking about moving trained auditors. What we are talking about is training people who are not auditors to follow up on the results of the audit. Ms. Maloney, uh, five minutes. Uh. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, following up on um, your questions, Mr. Chairman, I'd like uh, Mr. Tobias to get back to the committee in writing a projected pilot project that we could put forward with uh, IRS employees where they are given the resources uh, to get off the phones, to do the collections, uh, what resources would you need? And I'd like it to be a pilot project that we could um, possibly compare to the pilot project we are having now with uh, contracting out to private sources. I, I um, don't want to use my time with your explanation. I'd like you to get it back in writing and we will look at it. We, we have a, a strong uh, working relationship uh, together productively. I'd like to ask a question of Mr. Cohen that follows up on the exchange we just heard on confidentiality. Um, Mr. Tobias raised a concern and one that I share on confidentiality. I truly believe that tax collection is one of the most sensitive and Im important uh, jobs of government and it has to be done fairly and well or the trust between people and their government will not be there. And I am very uh, concerned about confidentiality, not only uh, within the IRS on individuals' tax returns, but I'm very troubled about the idea of contracting out to private firms and, and uh, the confidentiality situation. Also, what troubles me, what if a private firm acts in a way that is uh, irresponsible, then that reflects back on government and may undermine the, the confidence that people have in their government. And, 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 and as a follow-up on it, earlier you talked about Section 6103, which you helped write. And um, again, I'd like to uh, request that possibly you may get your, your comments back to me in writing um, of any changes that you think should take place in Section 6103 to protect uh, confidentiality of American citizens while helping government be uh, more efficient and effective in doing their job. One of the problems that was discussed earlier in the hearing was the browsing. Uh, now, in the early 60s, before we had the computer system, browsing was on paper. So if you locked the cage, only the people who had authorization to go look for returns could look for returns. Now, that's not to say there wasn't browsing. Uh, you know, if Sheldon Cohen's return was next to President Clinton's return, they could have looked at President Clinton. It doesn't happen to be. It happens to be filed in the commissioner's office. But they could have looked at the next returns. It was much more difficult, however. With a computer, it's easier. And, and uh, that is a problem that's going to exist every day of every year, no matter what your rules are. You've got to impose strong management controls, and you do have to enforce them. You do have to make people suffer when they break those rules, because they shouldn't be rummaging through returns. Uh, they will, and then you'll have to discipline them again. Uh, the more people that are, have access, the more difficult it will be. So if you introduce private contractors to this, it will be, and it will be more difficult. You will also find that the private contractor does work that is at conflict with the government work. So they will have to build firewalls, but they won't build firewalls. Someone somewhere on a private contractor will use the information he got from the IRS information to help his boss do something else. And then there will be a scandal, and then the IRS will be blamed for the leakage of the information from one cell of the collection system to the other cell. It will happen. I mean, that's why erasers are on the end of pencils, because errors do occur. So you, you do need to know that no matter how careful you are, errors will occur. You have to build the system that corrects as many of them as possible. Uh, that's okay. I'd like to ask all the panelists to either comment or, or get back to me in writing. And I'm particularly interested in your comments, Mr. Cohen, uh, with your experience as a tax lawyer and your former experience in government. Um, on Friday, 2020 ran a special on United States citizens evading their taxes and 2020 infiltrated a tax seminar in Cancun, uh, Mexico, 
that taught 300 individuals, American citizens, on how to set up, quote, personal sham banks offshore. The banks only need to have a mailing address. Since international banks do not have to pay taxes in the United States, these citizens could possibly evade billions of dollars uh, in taxes. And what could we do uh, to the IRS code or to uh, government laws to make sure that this does not take place? It obviously is taking place, and they ran an entire special on it. I have a film of it. I'd be glad to get it to any of you who'd like to see it. Your comments, and then I have one other brief question, and my time's almost up. My comments on the, on the banks. There, you see scans. I, I get this literature all the time in my, in my office. I mean, do this, do that, and you'll, 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 your clients will avoid this or that. And I, what I do is I send them to Mr. Dolan. I, I just take them and stick them in another envelope and write <laughs> Mr. Dolan a, a net memo and say, turn this over to the appropriate people. There are lots of silly, illegal ideas out there. You, you, you know, I mean, the word, it's a free country. You can say any screwy thing you want to say. Um, Unfortunately, some people fall into these patterns, and I'm sure the IRS can tell you what techniques they've designed, and they do design. They clip the newspapers. They clip these, uh, they watch the television. They, they pick up these stories, Apparently, and they set up programs happening. to try to pick them up. Now, those, most of most time it works, but not always. Any other comments on it? Um, over the weekend, uh, Speaker Gingrich uh, uh, stated that he uh, felt that uh, Americans that, that um, have overdue taxes, that they should be given a one-year amnesty to pay up without penalties. And he says that it's an idea that would bring in billions of dollars in extra revenue. And I'd like to ask the panelists if they'd like to comment on this idea. Do you believe it would bring in extra revenue, and do you think it would work? I'm not so sure that it would work. Um, I think that there has been some success with tax amnesty efforts in the in, in state governments, um, but it was primarily related to states where there wasn't real active tax enforcement. At the federal level, there's no question that there has been knowledge and enforcement. So the idea that somebody could go for years without paying and then suddenly be relieved of all of that liability and be relieved of all of that liability um, through a tax amnesty period, I think, would punish those who have tried to be compliant over the years and force them once again to subsidize the non-compliant. I, I don't think it's a good idea. The worst thing that could happen to you is you'd be successful. And the reason I say that is that you'd then be tempted to do it a second time and then you'd ruin the whole tax system. It would just absolutely ruin your discipline. So, I mean, I go along with the comments that Mr. Tobias just mentioned. That is, in any state where it's had any degree of success, it has been associated with an in, a markedly increased enforcement effort. They, they announced that we're gonna do it today, and as of tomorrow, we're gonna have this new and impressive enforcement effort. You have a reasonably good enforcement effort in the United States right now. I doubt if the Congress, the Congress is cutting the IRS's budget. Is the IRS going to get a 10 percent increase next year because they're going to have an increased effort? No. So you're, you don't have any credibility on that side. So, and you got more downside than upside. I think you stay home, as my grandmother used to say, when in doubt, stay home. <laughs> Time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let, I just have two questions to round out the panel. Uh, I might add on the last question, it seems to work with uh, overdue books at libraries, and uh, it, I, it sounds a little in uh, your remarks, Mr. Cohen, and I think you might be right about that, uh, much like the amnesty for illegal immigrants. Uh, more come and figure there'll be another amnesty, and it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, I've got one question for Ms. Davis, which is, you've heard a lot this morning from GAO, your colleagues on this panel. Is there anything you'd like to say based on your experience of being inside the IRS? Well, I guess it's sort of a reiteration of what I said in my testimony. I think that if we are going to really bring any significant change to the IRS, we have to get beyond what, what I call this broken record of GAO reports, congressional hearings, you know, the litany on and on and on, you know, with bringing out this broad array of, of significant problems at the IRS and actually 
begin to take significant action. One of the things that, that I did as the historian for the IRS was I looked at a long view of GAO reports. I didn't just look at last year's GAO reports, the most recent GAO reports, even the last five years of GAO reports, but I looked at a 20-year span. One of the first projects I took on that was squelched by IRS management very quickly when they learned what I was planning to do was to do an overview history of how the IRS had implemented its initial computer system that Mr. Cohen has, has spoken of back in the early 1960s, and then its plans you know, to modernize um, that system over the years. One of the things I also did, in addition to pulling every GAO report that had been written over this 20, 25 year span, was actually I tried to collect all IRS internal audit reports because, of course, that function of the IRS, you know, which is supposed to evaluate IRS internal progress you know, for their own programs, um, has done report after report about the modernization program also. First problem I encountered was when I asked for this broad range of internal audit reports for a 20 year span, they looked at me like I was crazy. And this is, you know, in my early in my tenure at the IRS when I realized that they had no systematic way. They didn't keep these reports. We went all around the country with a memo and we, we managed to come up with about 60% of the internal audit reports. But the point being that when I reviewed those 20 years of internal audit reports by the IRS and 20 years of GAO reports, the same problems were repeated over and over and over again. So we're facing another you know, 20 years of more GAO reports, more hearings, more internal audit reports without any significant change unless someone in Congress gets serious about really getting to the heart of this issue. Well, we thank you. Let me, that leads to my next question, besides the getting serious by some in Congress. I think we've got enough that want to be serious this time. Uh, a dear colleague letter from our colleague from Northern Virginia, Frank uh, Wolf, uh, talks about his legislation, H.R. 1224, and this is a question I want to direct at Mr. Cohen and Mr. Tobias. Just read uh, one paragraph of what it's about. H.R. 1224 does two important things. First, it establishes a set six-year term for the commissioner, thereby providing an important degree of independence from the president. Second, H.R. 1224 establishes a new objective selection process for the commissioner. Prior to the expiration of a commissioner's term or when a vacancy occurs, a special selection commission is established to consider potential candidates for commissioner. The commission then submits to the president a slate of qualified candidates and the president selects his nominee from that slate. H.R. 1224 ensures that strong, qualified candidates are selected for IRS commissioner, further ensures the commissioner is afforded necessary insulation and distance from attempts to make the IRS a tool for the party in power at the White House. I believe that legislation is greatly needed to ensure integrity and objectivity at IRS. How do you feel about that, Mr. Cohen? Well, let me, I, I do un spell out a little bit of my views on the commissioners in my, in my written statement, but I... I haven't addressed quite all of these issues. There's no involuntary servitude in the United States that was abolished in the 13th and 14th Amendments in the United States. So six-year term, there are, I see all the commissions around town with four-year terms, five-year terms, 15-year terms, whatever they happen to be. I see, rarely see anybody serve that period of time. I mean, I served over four years as Commissioner of Internal Revenue, a year as Chief Counsel, uh, five years in the one agency. That's a long time. It, it, the reports, as I've seen them of Brookings and other places, say about two, two and a half years is probably more normal. Uh, I think a four year, I think that four year was important. It was important for me because I could get something done. It was important for the agency because it had some continuity. And Mr. I don't Cohen, I might remind you, we have a 10 year term for the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And no one's yet ever served it. Well, but uh, there's hope that they will, and they'll go beyond one administration. I'll bet you five bucks and right now, Mr. Boyd. We also have the <laughs> well, bet on the next one. We've also got the Controller General of the United States, and uh, I think you will agree that most Controller Generals, unless they've died in office, have served out that term, which you've, is you've, you've had two. You've only had two serve under that term, uh, and, and I've served on the advisory committee yeah. for both of them. And the Controller General is in a completely different 
spot because the Comptroller General is a quasi-legislative employee. He really is a legislative employee. He is not an executive branch employee. Besides, I mean, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so I won't regale you now with the, with the constitutional problem of having the chief revenue official of the United States, who is part of the executive branch of the United States, chosen without regard to the President of the United States. I won't, I won't, I don't want to get no, into that right now because that's a Ms. long Ms. discussion. Mr. Mr. Wolf provides that that nominee would come from the President of the United States, but there'd be a list of very qualified people and uh, for those of us... Can he send the list back and say, I want more? Well, uh, he perhaps can, but if you're <coughs> saying, let us get some people in there that know something about management and are not simply tax technicians, all due respect to all the fine people that have been commissioners, the fact is that agency of over 100,000 people needs somebody like a Jim Webb. Now, you knew Jim Webb. Who I knew was Jim Webb. Who administrator of NASA. I mean, there was a And person Jim Webb was chosen by the President of the United States. United States. Uh, fine, but we have, we've had numerous presidents not choose somebody that could run an agency. We got a long list of them, and the failures of the agency, I would blame partly on the fact that we don't have a management structure and somebody that knows how to run a large organization. I, I'm not going to differ with that assessment. That is, we need, this is, this is a, I, I will, as I've said in my testimony, this, the IRS is like running a large spaghetti factory. It is more important that the person running the spaghetti factory have management know-how than it is that he or she know how to make spaghetti. On the other hand, they better know how to taste spaghetti because otherwise they're going to produce something like a Soviet factory. They'll put out a blah product that nobody will ever eat. Uh, so you, you, you can't make this a, a little narrow point because there are a whole variety of talents that are needed and I'm not sure it, it may be that your selection technique will produce the only two people that are produced that, that, that have those kinds of terms that the FBI director has those terms although he is chosen by the president he's not chosen by slate the GAO has it where where where, where the Congress sends a panel of names and the but that's because it is an officer of the Congress that's being chosen. It is not an officer of the executive department. No, and we're not talking about officers of Congress in this particular But this is an officer of the executive department yeah. who is nominated by people who are not of the executive department. I, I'm, yeah. I as I say, I'm, not a, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not a constitutional well, lawyer. Well, I think I, I get the drift of your views. To your friends on, on the that. Judiciary Committee to argue yeah. uh, I Mr. wouldn't Tobias. want to be selected under such a technique yeah. if a commissioner of internal revenue doesn't have sufficient internal <coughs> intestinal fortitude. I, my, my statement used to be, people would ask me, and I said, if you don't threaten to resign at least twice a year over a port, an important issue, you oughtn't be in the job. Uh, there are times when you say, no, I will not do that. I did that to the secretary. I did that to the president. I didn't do it very often. If you do it too often, you oughtn't be there either. But if you're going to have independence, you're going to have independence. And if you're not going to have independence, this technique's not going to help. Because if you're there, when there's a Secretary of Treasury of a different persuasion and a President of a different persuasion, your life is going to be impossible. You're never going to get a budget through. You're never going to get your personnel through the Office of Personnel Management. There are, a whole, there are just a million other problems that are going to come up every day that is going to make your life miserable. Mr. Tobias? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that um, one of the key problems with the IRS is the fact that commissioners turn over too frequently. I like the idea of a five-year or a six-year term, but I do not believe that a hiring a commissioner with a five- or a six-year term, however that person is nominated or selected, um, is the silver bullet. I think that no matter how well a person with a six-year term planned, if there isn't a steady stream of funds um, from the Congress in order to allow a plan to be created, implemented, and evaluated along the way without the circumstances changing, it won't matter really who's in charge of the IRS. It will be a great public relations. But if we don't have appropriate funding, um, and secondly, I think that the Internal Revenue Service, both in terms of its um, 
ability to obtain more credibility and its ability to plan long term needs some help. Um, the Commission to Restructure the IRS is considering several different options. One is strengthening right. uh, the We're role of the Treasury. The and another is to create um, a, a more independent IRS with a board of directors and those boards, of the, those members would be from people from the outside with managerial expertise. Uh, that report will be due on, on July 1st. But clearly the Internal Revenue Service has to be thinking more long term than just one year to the next. Well, we thank you all, Ms. Davis, gentlemen. Uh, we appreciate the time you've taken here and uh, having the uh, perspective you provide based on your experience. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next panel is panel three. Uh, Michael uh, Dolan, the uh, Deputy Commissioner, uh, primarily for Management, Internal Revenue Service, accompanied by Jim Donaldson, Chief Compliance Officer, Tony Music, Chief Financial Officer, Arthur A. Gross, Chief Information Officer, and David Matter, Chief Management and Administration. your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All five witnesses have uh, affirmed that uh, the oath, and we will start uh, with uh, Michael Dolan, the Deputy Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service. Thank you very much for coming, Mr. Dolan. Thank you for having us. I was sitting out there, though, thinking that uh, batting cleanup on the 14th of April uh, with uh, people who preceded us was uh, kind of a tough spot to be in until I heard you talk about what might have even been a tougher spot on the 15th of April on the, in the well of the Congress doing tax returns. So I'll, uh, I'll assume that we got the better of the deal. And what I would do, uh, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, is I prepared a longer statement and that I know you'll accept into the record. And what I'd like right. to do in the interest of time and probably getting to your questions is kind of briefly make uh, some of the points that I try to make. Feel free uh, for a 10-minute summary. In your case, if you'd like 15 minutes, please feel free, because you've heard a lot here, and you obviously have the experience to know a tremendous number of the basic questions that have been asked. Thank you. Um, I, would, uh, I would say, uh, for starters, that, uh, that one of the th things I think we all feel important about is, is the opportunity to talk uh, about and respond to some of your questions in several of the areas raised this morning because, uh, to say the least, uh, some of the observations were interesting. To say it a little more aggressively, there are some places that we'd like very much to be able to correct some misperceptions. Um, and I start, though, with uh, conceding your basic point that we're here talking at your invitation about high risk areas. Right. Risk, by definition, mean that there are uh, opportunities and requirements to improve. And uh, so I stipulate that. Not for a minute do we shrink or shirk from that. But the second thing that I wish uh, my colleagues from the GAO might have made a little stronger point uh, in their testimony uh, that would accompany the point they made in their documents is that in each of the four areas that we've identi been identified as high risk, there have been considerable progress. And so I'd like to I believe we're sitting before you today not with uh, some set of promises about what we're going to do in the future, but with some established track record in each of the four areas of where we have tried very hard and with some success in making progress against each of the four areas. And thirdly, and you, you've made the point, Mr. Chairman, several times that uh, in the context of looking at the IRS and looking at its, uh, at its management challenge, uh, clearly it, it strikes me that uh, any enterprise our size or the size of any uh, large corporation is by definition going to have some risk. And so I assume what you want from us is not a guarantee that we'll never run a risk, but I assume what you want from us is what you'd want from any major em enterprise, uh, uh, some conviction that we are capable of mitigating risk and capable of identifying, creating systems that in the first instance identify the risk and then do our level best to manage that risk, not in some theoretical context, but in the context of our business. And one of the things I was particularly appreciative of Mr. Tobias's uh, testimony is 
that we've found ourselves in pretty much of a chorus of commentary here the last two years, and some of that commentary is very well informed, uh, very much on the mark, and very much with uh, an aspiration, I think, of improving tax administration. There's another part of that chorus that you no doubt have heard some of yourself, where, where you're less sure that the chorus is well informed, and, and you're less sure that the outcome of the rhetoric is designed to improve the system as opposed to making some rhetorical points or trying to sort of play in a, in a, in a different, with a different kind of agenda. So what, one of the things I think Mr. Tobias did that I, I my longer statement does at, at uh, some length is make the point that notwithstanding being here uh, to talk about four risk areas, if you look at those four at risk areas in the context of the operations of the organization, there are a tremendous number of things that are going well, not only at the level that Mr. Tobias talked about in terms of some macro measure of uh, how much it costs to collect $100. But most people, we're on the ap April 14th. Most people relate that to April the 15th, which most people relate to a filing season. This is a filing season that, by any measure historically we've made, or I think any measure that people would impose on us today, is good news for the taxpayer and it's good news for the system. And that's not most people, uh, that's most people's encounter with us is during this four-month period. Most people think of uh, filing season is January and April. I think, as you well know, Mr. Chairman, it starts last fall. As Mr. Cohen said, uh, we got there were no tax legislation at the at end of last session. He got 700 pages of tax instructions about those three bills that passed at the end of the year. We got hundreds of changes that in August and September went online. About the time that we reached August 15th's peak of this year's extensions, we'll be back through that cycle again. So practical terms, the filing season is a year-long business. And this year, there are some things that I think, if you look at it from the standpoint of the taxpayer, um, and I, I, you yourself gave a litany and others gave litanies about uh, programs that, uh, that aren't what we'd like them to be and some programs that we were under leveraged. But as Mr. Tobias said, we're going to process 211 individual and business returns this year. From the period 93 to 96, we did that almost 11 percent more effective, more efficient, with fewer staff years than we did in the 93 t time frame. Telefile, which for my money is one of the most significant retail technological options offered to a citizen in this country. The opportunity if you had an 8 to 10 minute telephone call to completely satisfy your tax obligation. I've heard a lot of ballyhoo about people who can apply for this or apply for that or get a piece of information downloaded. But accomplishing your entire transaction with your government on something as sensitive as your t meeting your tax obligation, 25 million Americans this year are capable of doing that in an 8 to 10 minute call. At this point in the year, over 4 million have done it. Over 17 million at this point in the year have filed in a variety of electronic forms. Those, I think, are evidence of things that are working well. Um, Last month, we made available to sm some small businesses in 14 states the opportunity to file their 941, a quarterly tax return by telefile. That historically was a very convoluted pr process for big or small business because it represented sending us a coupon and hoping that the coupon and the, and the dollars got uh, posted correctly to their account. Now again, in those 14 states, a million employers are capable, whether I'm a pizza shop with uh, seven people and I don't want to go to the bank or whether I'm a bigger enterprise. I pick up, use my touchstone phone in the course of a few minutes, make my quarterly tax obligation. Assisting taxpayers better. Well, uh, several people talked about this sort of conflict in our mission or balance in our mission. Clearly, Mr. Chairman, you have, have made it real clear from the outset that accounts receivable is a passion with you. It is with us as well, but it's one of the pieces of our mosaic that we try to balance each year. This year, we came into the year fully aware that for the last two years, one of the metaphors of our performance has been, can we answer our phones? Because it didn't make any difference that when we answered our phone, we were answering at 94, 95 percent quality. The fact that half of our customers couldn't get to us was too easy a metaphor for the entire organization. So we went to gargantuan efforts this year to try to put online, to try to beg, borrow, and steal, try to tip that balance, if you will, a little bit to the service side, with the outcome that this year, rather than half of the people being served, nearly three-quarters of people are being served. Now, if I'm running a business, I'm not bragging about only three-quarters of my customers being served. So we know we've got a long way to go, but I think as measured in the context of, of actual operations, it's a fairly significant commentary on the organization's ability to respond to its customers in a way that's important. 
people talk about uh, the, the GAO sort of rolls off their tongue that we're using old systems and the implication left none of it modernized and all of it still in the knuckle dragging ways of the past. Well, I dare say that anybody who has decided to take its information from us on a website in the last couple of years find that to be a remarkable way to do something that you only ever used to be able to do the IRS office, the bank, or the post office, and they would have people consistently scrambling this week. Instead, a hundred million times this year, uh, and multi-million forms and publications have been drawn down. I don't know about you, I, I can't go to a soccer field or church over the weekend without somebody saying, hey, I was looking for my extension form, or I was looking for this arcane past form, and I pulled it down on your website. Is that the whole ballgame? Not by any means. But it's that plus the CD-ROM, and we now put in the hands of practitioners and anybody else that wants it, the fax capability to come to us any hour of the day and get a form back to you by fax. Those, to me, are not commentary as an organization that's trying to do its business like it did in the 60s and, and insular from its customers' expectations. You heard a little bit this morning about some of the rest of our business. Uh, I'd like for there not to be 200 plus billion dollars in accounts receivable. I think we, uh, upon questioning, we'll probably realize that that's a number that's clearly able to to create a couple of different impressions, uh, several of them not exactly on the money. But I will tell you that uh, that of of our one of our key compliance um, requirements is is to collect the amount of money, not only because it's there to collect, but because as several of the witnesses said, that's that's kind of an element of fairness in the entire system. If you pay yours and I pay mine, and the people to the left and right of us um, see that, they're confident in the system. If they see the people to the left and right of them not paying, then there's a basic fairness in addition to the obvious financial interest the government has in, in collecting its receivables. Last year was the single most successful year we've had in our history of collecting uh, the dollars in that accounts receivable. One part of it was a function of still being able to capitalize on the revenue initiative that came in 95. But another part of it, again, was a function of looking at many, many aspects of our processes, not being content to use 60s, 70s, 80s processes, but looking at the whole notice stream and eliminating notices that were confusing the taxpayers and weren't producing the outcome, changing our bills to look like a bill that comes from a credit card, accentuating our telephone operations, accentuating in-business taxpayers who we can get within maybe not always the 30-day time frame that you mentioned, but while they're in business and while they're still capable of resolving their issues instead of downstream. We've done some things that by traditional standards would have been viewed as, uh, as lax on enforcement. We have substantially utilized uh, both the installment agreement process and the offer and compromise process as a way to take taxpayers who might not be able to pay fully but are trying to get in or stay in the system. And I think you could go up and down a variety of other initiatives that would reflect on the way that we've attempted to, to make our uh, collection processes, uh, improve our collection processes. In the four risks that GAO talked about this morning in our, in our documents, they're clearly not all equal. Uh, I think you point out, Mr. Chairman, uh, quite, quite aptly that uh, really the technology, the ability of us to modernize our, our technology infrastructure is as uh, I think it was Senator Thompson the other day said over on the other side that it's the long pole in the tent. It clearly is the, uh, the most significant of the risks, uh, and if we're capable of mitigating that in a way that I think we're well positioned to do, then the concerns that we have with respect to the accounts receivable, the concerns we have with respect to data security, the concerns we have with respect to getting a clean audit opinion uh, will indeed be buttressed by our ability to do to modernize our infrastructure. My statement goes to some length, and I, I, I guess at the hour of the day you probably um, would prefer that I not go to, to much length on the modernization uh, uh, punch list, but there really are a, a tremendous number of things that have um, happened since uh, the last time anybody before the IRS was, uh, before the IRS was before you. At my left is Art Gross. Uh, he'll get an opportunity in your questioning to, to uh, speak a little more directly to some of those at your, at your interest, but uh, suffice it to say that we have tried to include in our long statement the roadmap as we see it for uh, addressing not only the uh, latest round of general accounting office issues, but as we can best determine it, the set of outside feedback and commentary from the National uh, uh, Research Council, from within Treasury, from the various bodies of Congress that have looked at modernization over the 20 plus years that you detailed in your statement. And we do believe that we've got 
uh, ourselves positioned at a point in time now to do what is the long pull, to do what won't happen overnight and be a silver bullet, but do the kind of uh, improvement of the technology infrastructure that not only the system requires, but that our customers require. I've also included in my longer statement uh, a fair amount of information about the so-called browsing. Uh, I think uh, none of us sits at this table at all happy that the condition prevails. It is a circumstance that, uh, that is unacceptable to us as it, as it should be the American taxpayer. People who have access to tax information who work for the IRS have access for one purpose and, that, and one purpose alone, that's to pursue their job responsibilities. Any use beyond that is unacceptable. The difficulty we have is in the, in the uh, computer infrastructure we have today, it's very much more difficult on the front end of those systems identifying exactly who has a work unit that involves access to a particular piece of taxpayer information. As a consequence, we find ourselves doing after the fact running of audit trails and developing scenarios that will detect abuse and then dealing with that abuse as it's detected. Our modernized infrastructure will deal with that fundamentally. It's a, it not only uh, possible, but it's a goal of ours on the front end of the modernized systems to be able to move work precisely and specifically to an individual employee based on a particular assignment and not, as is done today, based on a range of assignments and based on a range of authorities. In the interim, we know it's our responsibility to step up to even more redoubled effort to train, to educate, to communicate, and to discipline, and to make the discipline be severe and make the discipline be consequential when abuses uh, continue. What I, would, uh, what I would offer for your uh, observation, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, there's a whole lot more I could talk about here, uh, and probably uh, I'd serve your needs and mine both better by letting you go in the areas that you'd like to question us. I uh, got off to the track here in a kind of rude way. I didn't introduce my colleagues. I, Irish, and you wind me up and I take off. And so if, I, if you wouldn't mind if I could just spend a minute recognizing that on my far left is Mr. Music, who I know has been before you before. He's our CFO. To my immediate left is Art Gross, our Associate Commissioner, CIO. Dave Maters, our Chief Management Administration. And on Dave's right is John Dalrymple, who is the deputy uh, in our essentially operations function. And with that, I will um, I'll close and, uh, and instead uh, invite your questions, and hopefully we can be responsive to those. Well, since I'm half Irish, I can uh, sympathize with you, and uh, I enjoyed what you had to say. Let me pursue a few of the points you'd made, and then we'll go down the line on a area. One of the things that really concerns people is the browsing, snooping issue, if you will. Uh, I was assured by the commissioner a year or so ago that IRS had taken action to reduce browsing, and there were several people under indictment for in violating the statute. I'm just curious, what happened to them? Were any people ever indicted? Were they fired? What? Uh, the, the answer is, is yes to all of the above, but if you permit me to roll it back maybe just a right. frame or two before that. When the commissioner has been before you, as she has before others, uh, she said uh, unequivocally that browsing was not acceptable and not to be condoned. And what she and the rest of the senior management team have tried to do is drive that down in the organization in all the ways you would expect in a large organization. We've taken and adjusted the, the tables of penalties that apply to disciplinary action. We've instructed those who are responsible for taking discipline uh, that that abuses or unauthorized accesses were to be, be, were be to be treated very seriously in the discipline process. We've created a, well, basically a system we call the electronic access research log, which gives us an opportunity to take in a much more cogent way these audit trails and determine where there are potential abuse. We've developed case processing procedures in the personnel and the inspection uh, and the line management process to ensure that, that not only the right, they, they, that detection of uh, abuses takes place, but that the discipline uh, be appropriate and be consistent. We have taken uh, a variety of steps. We've actually uh, uh, prosecuted uh, on a number of occasions cases, some of which uh, we have found bouncing back on us because while we had a standard that we thought was clear, the courts have in some instances um, distinguished though between those instances where somebody uses information for some purpose and in other instances where they do what they, what they have dubbed self-disclosure. So if that person has access to information and made no further use of it, 
uh, some of our prosecutions and some of our disciplines have failed because people have looked at that and said the standard of conduct is not explicit enough to have put the employee on notice that that's unacceptable. A couple of things have happened in the meantime. We have made it administratively explicit that it doesn't make any difference whether you use the information or not. If it's an unauthorized access, it's offensive and it is actionable with respect to, the, to a disciplinary action. On the side, on the automated access side, as I think you know, the, the changes last year to Title 18 have now uh, substantially improved the ability to take a criminal prosecution where the access is one that occurs through, techno through, a, through automation. Um, both uh, Chairman Archer and Senator Glenn have bills working in the House and Senate to take that same provision and overlay it on paper accesses. So we're hopeful that those additional attributes will help us uh, continue to try to make uh, this less and less the type of risk that an individual employee takes and more and more the kind of uh, protection that we can sit here in front of you and say that we have greater confidence that it's not going to go on. Well, I don't want to create 106,000 pieces of paper in the agency, but it seems to me you could get employees to sign a statement that I am aware of uh, this policy and I will not violate it. Now, do we have something like that? Uh, maybe, Mr. Mayor. Um, we do have a policy uh, when employees first come on to the Internal Revenue Service as part of our uh, orientation program. We talk about the rules of conduct and, and as Mr. Dolan mentioned, uh, safeguarding taxpayer information is, is in those rules of conduct. When you're trained and profiled to access our computer systems, you sign the very kind of form that you mentioned advising that you, you have been told um, what the rules and regulations are and what the ramifications are for, for violating them. Every time, every time a, an IRS employee accesses one of our main systems, a warning screen comes on and reminds them another time about unauthorized access. Now, approximately how many thousand employees have access to this information? I think, uh, don't hold me to the exact number, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 55,000 people would have responsibilities that would take them into what is our principal, one of our principal online systems, our integrated data retrieval system. Um, so over half the agency personnel have access. In, in, now, in, in having the access, they all have got different kinds of access. Depending upon the nature of my job, I may have access that allows me research, I may have access that allows me to adjust, I have, may have some combination. Mm -hmm. The specific authorities and with that um, comes the, the passwords and the, uh, the specific accreditations that are, that, that are akin to my job. About a billion five transactions take place over that one integrated data retrieval system in the course of a year by these 55 some thousand people. We're talking about an incredibly fractional number of instances in which there's any unauthorized. One is too many, but in the context of the 50-some thousand people being asked to do those key responsibilities across that data. A at what point have we found the weakness in the system in the sense that they could make the claim that, gee, this employee really didn't know it was a problem? Uh, has that come at the internal IRS or Treasury level of where discipline was administered, that claim was made, and they haven't been able to stick? No, where has it happened, or has it hadn't been in court uh, before they uh, what, got what, this? Uh, we talked a little bit about the court. In the administrative action, it goes something like this. The, uh, this URL system will produce um, a lead. The lead will go to some combination typically of a line person, a personnel person, maybe an inspection person, they will develop the lead. They'll go back into the person's uh, assignments. They'll make some judgment as to whether it appears that this is a good lead or a good lead, meaning a, a lead that looks like it does reflect is the Is this lead a tip? Is that well, the equivalent? Well, it's a tip, but it's a tip that comes from as a result of massaging these thousands of audit trails. And right. then I don't, without getting into a lot of explicit detail here, it will take characteristics. It'll look for there have been a series of scenarios developed that are high likelihoods of abuse scenario. Not every one of them reflects abuse, but they will narrow a set of leads. Those leads will then subsequently have to go back into the individual employee's precise work assignments, precise, fa precise fact patterns, and determine that, yes, this lead turns out to be an instance of abuse. When it is, that instance of abuse, that allegation of abuse, will go to the head of office 
the head of office will end up having their personnel people uh, develop a adverse action or disciplinary action. It will be taken. It may or may not be appealed. One of the things that we found upon appeal is, again, we're operating within a system. The federal disciplinary system assumes a couple things. It assumes, for the most part, discipline is progressive. What that means in a, in a code word is that typically a person is um, disciplined for a first offense and given some uh, opportunity to, uh, to remediate their performance or to, um, uh, to improve on the job. Not no, always. In other words, nothing happens no. if they don't do it again. No, uh, what I'm, what I'm so you can get one crack at a rock star, a celebrity, uh, uh, a politician? I knew I was going down a wrong road giving that long explanation. <laughs> uh, that's not the rule. It isn't yeah. the rule. What, I'm, what I was trying to give you was, you, I think you asked no, me. No, I'm just trying to get how the process There are works. no one cracks. Yeah. There are no one cracks. You do it once, it's wrong. What I was trying to describe to you in the context of the precedent that built up in the Merit System Protection Board, the courts, and everywhere else, there are some supervening rules about how you do discipline in the government. So I can sit here, and you and I can sit here and say, by golly, it's wrong one time, and it ought to be a firing, and nobody ought to have any appeal or any, any recompense on that. That's not the real world. The real world that we have taken these disciplines into is a world that is surrounded by the practice and precedence of the general disciplinary system. And so what we've tried to do, as I mentioned at the outset, we've tried to make our penalty provisions be explicit about ranges. We've tried to say to our directors, propose on the high end and make it uh, make it very difficult to mitigate from the high end, meaning removal. So principally our reaction is going to be removal when it is a willful access. When it's some trainee in the first week who bounces up there and comes back and says, wait a minute, I did it, I didn't mean to, that person's probably not going to be removed. But the willful um, access is, is something that uh, we will we'll be pursuing removal as a first resort. Willful is very hard to prove, is it not? It is, but, uh, but I say that as a distinction from, um, we have a system, our systems today, Mr. Chairman, lock you out of your own account. Everybody knows they lock you out of your own account. Notwithstanding that, we will have people, we will have on the audit trail evidence that somebody tried to go to their own account. And when you go to that person, you can get one of two answers. You could find somebody who was brand new, either didn't understand or whatever went up and bounced, and that'll come back as a, as a transgression. Or you can find some of your best employees who will tell you, when I've been all day long entering Social Security numbers, bringing up accounts to resolve them, on occasion they will end up entering their own Social Security just because of the way the mind works with those data fields. And so you'll have that pop out. They won't have gotten to their account because they're frozen, but it'll show up. And when you go back to that person, if it is indeed somebody that there's no history of anything else, you might look at that and say, okay, I, t I take that explanation of what it was for and, and that it's not some attempt to game the system. Well, how many people have you had any effective discipline with? And what penalties have you given? And how many are involved? How many were brought up to the disciplinary system? And what happened as a result of that disciplinary system? Mr. Chairman, what I'd like to do uh, is submit for the record a, a summary of of those actions from FY94 through the year to date. But, but let me, if I would, just talk about uh, 1996. Uh, there were a total of, and, and this goes back to what Mr. Dolan said, there were a total of 1,374 instances where the computer system kicked out a case that said There's, there may be something here you need to investigate it further. Uh, of that 1,374, 797 of them were confirmed as an unauthorized access. And of those cases, um, 93 employees were separated, either involuntarily or they resigned before we could separate them. Um, there were 411 cases, or rather 476 cases, where upon further investigation, there was no unauthorized access. So what I'd like to do is, is submit this for the record, because I know there's been a lot of numbers in the press in the last week, and, and I, I think it's important well, for the fine. subcommittee it'll, to it'll see it'll be that. in the record without objection, but could you just give me the summary of, again, how many cases, how many didn't result in being cases once it was explored, how many went into the disciplinary system beyond the first or second stages, and what happened, and what okay. were the penalties? Of the uh, total... 1,374 cases, Right. 411 of them were not 
cases in which there was abuse. What were they? What's a typical one the 411 were? Where, as Mr. Dolan mentioned, when, when we actually pulled the work of the employee, we determined that, that the kind of access they had to a particular account was justified. Uh, and I don't, as Mr. Dolan said, we have several scenarios that are built on the front end of this system that pull together certain transactions. Um, well, one very good one, Mr. Chairman, is, uh, is that the system looks for multiple accesses to the same account. And on the face of it, that might look like somebody's got either a, uh, an, an, uh, an interest in, uh, in browsing or it might, in fact, be somebody who has had repeated conversation, repeated telephone calls from the same taxpayer and gone into the account several times to either look, on a, look at a refund or look at some other transaction. Well, of the 963 left, what happened? Okay, of the uh, remaining cases, there were 797 cases in which we confirmed there was an unauthorized access. 20 of those resulted in a caution letter to the employee. I'm sorry, 20 was 20 what? resulted in a caution letter to the employee. A caution order. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. 326 resulted in oral or written counseling, which is more severe uh, in our disciplinary system than just a caution letter. And again, Mr. Dolan had mentioned... Well, excuse me, the caution order doesn't go into their personnel file? No, it does not, sir. How do you have any trail that this person keeps doing these things if you don't put something in the personnel file? Th they're, they're given a letter uh, and the next instance would result in more severe discipline and that would go in their personnel file. Well, you got 326, you tell me, you did put in out of the 963 that Correct. remained after you got rid of a not a 411 by not really being abusive, uh, right. but uh, was justified. So I'm just trying to find out how the system works. And uh, so we get down to 326 where you've got oral and written. Now, is it both? It's either or. Either or. Either so or. how many actually had something put in their personnel files? Of the counseling is a step above the caution. The counseling okay. is formal discipline and a notation would be made in their personnel file. Sixty-two okay. employees received an admonishment. Now what's that do? Does that get into the personnel file? Yes, it does, sir. Okay, is that the first level that goes into the personnel file? Yes, sir. Okay, and 62 admonishments. 87 reprimands, which are more severe okay. than admonishments. 87 reprimands. 147 suspensions of 14 days or less. And that's without pay? That's without pay, sir. 38 suspensions greater than 14 days without pay, one reduction in pay, 93 separations from the service. 93 separations as a result of this incident, or did they have other reasons? As a result of this incident. Okay. So 93 were asked to leave and did. Yes, now, sir. did you lose any of those on appeal? I don't know, sir. I'd have to check the record. Yeah, would you mind? Check it, because uh, where did the union stand in all this? Did they back you on a no-browsing, no-tolerance, as the commissioner told me, policy? I think, for the most part, yes. I did. He, uh, Bob Tobias is a co-signatory on, on, uh, on a series of memorandum that have been put out on this. I think uh, they would be... Um, they would clearly have an interest in making sure that whatever disciplinary process works gives people an opportunity to explain themselves and defend themselves, but they've, they've, they have not uh, condoned it either. Any other data relevant to this? Yeah, Dave's got all four years there, as, or yeah. actually four years, and we'll provide all four to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Does it show a trend line in any way? It Is there that. less browsing now than there was four hours, four uh, years ago? No, it shows, Mr. Chairman, that as Mr. Dolan testified, that 95 and 96 are, are about the same. Um, so far, the trend in, in 97 is, is upwards a little bit. That's the classic dilemma, though, of uh, is the trend a function of better detection or is it a function of more instances? And I, 
as I sit here, I can't tell you, but I can I tell you we, we improve our detection, but I can't tell you in absolute terms what it reflects. Mm -hmm. Well, what we're talking about here is one thirteenth of the cases that start, there's an actual separation. Now, and a note is put in their personnel file. <laughs> A separation? A note on a separation. Separation yes. is actually. Is it a, simply that it's a separation, no, or no, does it state it, why the separation occurred? It's a, it's a, in the, within the personnel parlance, it'd be a, it'd be a permanent record that would re be reflected upon uh, anybody, any other federal employer pulling their right. federal jacket. It would be reflected. Okay. In, in other words, when they go to another agency the next day, and they phone back, presumably they're told that this person was separated for cause. Just, so, just, so, just not, not. Let me mislead you. There will be some instances in that 93 where, upon realizing that we were going to fire them, the person might have left. And when you leave before the actual discipline is accomplished, then your record would not reflect that. In other words, you can't fire me, I quit. Correct. Okay. Uh, do you think that's sufficient action, or should there have been any criminal action? I don't think any action that. What that was the biggest? number of voyeur cases you had in terms of one person accessing 200 files, 500 files? I, I, don't, I don't have those specifics uh, in front of me. I would tell you that uh, if, you, if you ask is it sufficient to the extent that it exists at all, it's not been sufficient. And mm -hmm. so I think we've still got a task ahead of us to eradicate it. Now, did any of these cases, were they ever taken to the U.S. attorney to ask for an indictment? Yes, some have, and we could get you more detail. I don't, I don't, yeah. I can't tell what you. What did the U.S. attorney say? Didn't want uh, to deal with it? No, in, in, uh, on several occasions, U.S. attorneys have taken the cases. Uh, we, I talked, we talk in our testimony about a couple that have not been successful, but uh, there are others that have been successful, and the U.S. attorneys are not reluctant to uh, help us pursue the prosecution, in the, particularly in the egregious cases. Are they primarily here in Washington, or no. are they out in the field? Principally in the field. Principally in the field. Uh, in terms of the U.S. Attorney's actions, could you give us a statement for the record of how many times you went to a U.S. Attorney wherever, field, separate field in Washington, and uh, times they took it and times they rejected it? And if so, what was the reason for rejection? Just they're overworked and have more serious things like murders or whatever. And uh, I understand that, but I'm not happy about it. And uh, what went on to a court? And uh, what did those courts rule on this? Did they give you any further instructions from the court as to clarity of policy or what? We, we could, uh, if, if um, in, in response to your invitation, why don't you let us give you the whole spectrum because the there whole are some. works. I want to know why this policy isn't working and it keeps occurring. Well, the other thing that I think will be implicit in anything we give you about this part of it is one that I suspect you would place you'd be anyway is that this is, at the end of the day, not something you're going to prosecute out of existence. Uh, because with the most cooperative U.S. attorneys in the world, what you want to do is you want to eradicate this on the front end. You don't want it to depend on prosecution. You want the deterrence of people knowing that not only will you, but upon prosecution, uh, it'll be a successful prosecution. But at the end of the day, our objective has been to eradicate this short of prosecution by the training, by the systems, by the front end proactive stuff to the maximum extent possible. In 1970s, early 70s, the Nixon White House, one presidential assistant went to federal prison for looking at one FBI file. Mm -hmm. We now have cases in the White House. We still don't know their reason for looking at 600 to 1,100 FBI files, and nothing's happened. I mean, is this just we change our sense of morality in three or four decades? or? Uh, uh, are we just incompetent in terms of our processes for dealing with discipline, or what? Well, I don't what think you, you, I don't really think you want me to do What me. would you do to change this process to make it very clear that this is serious <clears throat> business? Um, two, a couple of things. One is, uh, at the front end, I would like to be able to prevent more of it so that I don't have to explain it in any context of it being unacceptable, right. but it's just flat out impossible to occur. Other than that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know. You've, you've been involved in big organizations, and I think you know it's repetition, repetition, repetition. It's finding every possible way, uh, every medium available to you, training, information, communication, to continue to reinforce up and down the line with everybody to the point of people being tired of hearing you 
right. to reinforce it. But I don't That's think why I want them to sign a piece of paper and get it in the file. Well, and I think they need to sign it, and they need to sign it, and they need to sign it, because, again, yeah. the repetition one time doesn't do it yeah. on that score either. Yeah. Well, then maybe they shouldn't be working for your agency if they're that dumb. Well, I don't think people who are making unaccessed, uh, unauthorized access should be working for the agency. Yeah. Uh, let me move to uh, the results bit. We talked earlier in some of the testimony about uh, the Government uh, Performance and Results Act. Uh, in testimony to the Appropriations Subcommittee on the IRS fiscal year 1988 budget, the Commissioner stated that the IRS has outcome-oriented performance indicators. I assume that's a 1998 budget. Right. Yeah, a 1998 budget. Here it says 88. Thank you. It's 98, as I thought. The appendix to the FY 1998 included several measures. Now, I found them uh, rather interesting, and I, I'd like to put it in the record without objection. This is the chart that where it says FY 1998 performance measures and targets, and it starts in with mission effectiveness indicator, total net revenue, uh, uh, budget divided by burden, total true tax liability, uh, roughly 80 percent, 79.9, and goes down with a series of indicators uh, on collection under uh, uh, where we are on compliance, improved customer service, you mentioned some of that, uh, increase in productivity, uh, and then various budget activity code uh, measures such as processing accuracy, processing accuracy rate, so forth. And I guess I'd ask, why is refund timeliness uh, used? Does it serve the American people well if you send out refunds in a timely manner, but they're for the wrong amount to the wrong people? And how do we get at that problem? Well, in the first, in the first instance, uh, in the very largest percentage, in, in almost every instance, the right refund is going out to the right person within what we have identified as our customer service standard, which is within 40 days. And point of fact, if you're using both electronic input and taking your refund directly to your bank, you're going to get it out considerably um, quicker than that. But I, we do believe, Mr. Chairman, if I'm following your question correctly, that that is a measure our customers have told us is important to them. It doesn't have to be overnight, but it has to be predictable and has to be consistent. and. Are we looking at the uh, wrong r refunds and working that into the? Uh, uh, maybe your point is to the refund, uh, the refund yeah. fraud. Is that your? Is yeah. That here, well, let me just read you a little bit. It's a paragraph from the IRS Management Report, High Risk Series, United States General Accounting Office, February 1997. Quote, when we first identified filing fraud as a high-risk area in February 1995, the amount of filing fraud being detected by IRS was on an upward spiral. From 1991 to 1994, the number of fraudulent returns that IRS detected rose from 11,168 to 77,781, and the total amount of fraudulent refunds detected rose from $42.9 million to $160.5 million. In 1995, after being urged to take immediate action by us, Congress, and a Treasury <coughs> Task Force, IRS introduced new controls and expanded existing controls in an attempt to reduce its exposure to filing fraud. Those controls were directed toward either, one, deterring the filing of fraudulent returns, or two, identifying questionable returns after they'd been filed. Uh, then it notes that uh, uh, to deter the filing of fraudulent returns, IRS took several steps that were focused on electronic filers. As a result of these steps, IRS 1 expanded the number of upfront filters in the electronic filing system designed to screen electronic submissions for problems, such as the missing incorrect Social Security numbers, uh, to prevent returns with these problems from being filed electronically, and strengthened the process for checking the suitability of persons applying to participate in the electronic filing program as return preparers or transmitters by requiring fingerprint and credit checks. 
issues, all of which are good moves. To better identify fraudulent returns once they've been filed, IRS placed an increased emphasis in 1995 on validating the Social Security numbers on filed paper returns and delayed any related refunds to allow time to do these validations and to check for possible fraud. IRS also improved its questionable refund program by one, revising the computerized formulas used to score all tax returns as to their fraud potential, and two, upgrading the electronic fraud detection system to give staff uh, better research capabilities. I'll put the rest in the record. I won't bore you with reading it. You're probably well familiar with it. But uh, again, are we treating the electronic forms on refunds uh, differently and permitting more errors to get through simply because they haven't filed in paper. And in filing in paper, perhaps you have more time to deal with that. So That's where it. are we between those two filings? It, it's, uh, it's a, it's a uh, great question because it's actually just reverse. What, uh, and part of what uh, gets lost in the GAO narrative is, um, is there's a little bit of apples and oranges between uh, the kinds of returns that are being detected because not when the GAO first discovered this, but when we discovered it and the GAO then began writing reports on it, um, part of what we understood about both the paper and the electronic side was there were insufficient filters. What was happening on the electronic side is you had, my term, some bozo criminals out there who were putting together various pieces and trying to game the electronic system. What we've done over the last several years, particularly with these filters, is make it far less possible for somebody, it's impossible to, I never want to say impossible, highly unlikely today that a bogus social security number is going to get through the electronic processes because of the way that the electronic screens are able to look at all that data and, uh, and basically pull any of the mismatches out. And so what happens today, it used to show up as a case work for the downstream, is those cases reject up front. Now, in the instance where it's not anybody with fraudulent attempt, it's somebody who transposed their daughter's Social Security number or forgot their spouses or didn't make an adjustment with, of maiden to married name, those things reject. They don't ever get in the system. They reject. They're able to be corrected. When they're corrected, they process through. So the kinds of reliance where in the early years we were relying almost exclusively on catching those on the back end, particularly on the electronic side, uh, we're now able to uh, detect much, much, if not all, that on the front end. Let me move to another indicator uh, here, and that's the uh, number of calls uh, that are taken. And uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, wouldn't you agree that it isn't the fact that you uh, talk to the people over the telephone, but isn't the real measure a measure of the outcome, such as the calls correctly uh, answered? And I know from time to time we've all seen stories where they've checked the same question to different regional district offices and gotten different answers. Now, I don't know if I've forgotten if you have an internal review like that. And if so, a, could you tell me a little about sure. it and very, say, yep. why don't we have as one of the results indicators the accuracy of the, in, of the response rather than simply the fact that, yes, I talked to a taxpayer? We do, Mr. Chairman. And, okay. And, and let me, we actually have two other metrics that I think make your point. One is the, ac is the actual accuracy rate. And uh, you're quite correct that in years past, we had, it was quite a celebrated cause what the quality rate of the IRS was. Right. And you'd, a lot of pundits had a lot of fun with that. Uh, for the last several years, though, the GAO and the IRS have actually had their acts pretty well together. We have had a, a protocol for doing test calls and evaluating quality. It's posted weekly. It's tracked very carefully, at least on the appendix I have, which if it's the same one you're looking at, towards yeah. the bottom, oh, maybe a third of the way to the bottom of that, that's called something called taxpayer service tax law accuracy rate. Right, 92 percent. 92 percent. That would be one of the metrics that, would, that we would use. The other one up towards the top of that page under something called objective improved customer service, you see something called initial contract resolution rate. Mm -hmm. That's another metric that we think very important because we want the person to call, um, ask their question, and we want a person capable of resolving that issue then, not having to write us, call us back. And so those three things would work 
in uh, concert as a function of, of how well we're doing our customer well, service. Well, how, how is that 92 percent arrived? Is that simply a random sample check of your people, or do you uh, uh, know what they've said on each call? How can you, unless you tune in and tap them, it's actually How do you know? A, it's actually a, uh, a very precise formula agreed upon by the GAO before the start of a filing season where you take specific categories of calls, numbers, and you place a specific set of um, test calls that will give you statistical reliability of the result. You take that uh, at the front of the season, you, you agree with GAO, you have test calls made throughout the season. We report site by site so that every site is able to track week to week not only their gross quality rate, but know where they're, they're falling below uh, on a particular set of answers. So it's a fairly elaborate uh, process designed to give us that kind of feedback. What else do you think needs to be done in that area to improve accuracy? Um, well, we've got, a, we've got a significant number of um, automated systems that I think at the end of the day will take what I would call some of the more uh, easy traffic off of the system so that somebody who really has a relatively routine and is comfortable with the automated systems, that you can move that traffic off into those systems, thereby giving not only greater access, but knowing that the human beings that you have working on the phones are ones that you can continue to specialize. And so, at least arguably, you wouldn't have to spend as much time answering, where's my refund, or can I claim this dependent, and maybe somebody becomes more skilled in some of the more technical. So, so by being able to provide depth of training to uh, a greater range of our employees, I think that's probably the next best thing we can do. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that list and that appendix? What do you think the best outcome measure is? If you as a manager had to look at one thing, what would be the one that meant the most to you as to how the agency's doing? Well, I, as a manager, I, the first thing I'd want to do uh, is make sure that I knew where my board of directors uh, was going to come with that answer because I, I would probably tell you at any given time I'm trying to balance um, a, a, a success in both access and accuracy of my customer service mm -hmm. as well as my ability to collect my accounts receivable as well as my ability to place the rest of my compliance resource across those parts of the tax gap that are uh, most significant. So I think we're always in, and then overlaid on that, I'd say I'd hope I'm seeing productivity out of all corners of the organization, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the horse race we find ourselves in, mm -hmm. not always with a board of directors uh, uh, that 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 sees it the same way. Uh, you might want to file this for the record if you're not prepared to deal with it now. But last point I have on that appendix is which of those do you regard as out? Which of those indicators do you regard as outcome oriented? Do they meet the definition of an outcome indicator envisaged in the result? Performance and Results Act. I don't know if you've I'll had a chance to review I'll all these. I'll be happy to take your invitation yeah. of giving you something for the record. Okay, just file it in the record, then we'll take a look at it. Uh, let me ask you now on the lien problem. Uh, that's come up before, and uh, we have some horror stories, of course, that often uh, occur. Uh, though all of us have district offices, as you know, where uh, we have a staff that operates uh, as the Swedes would call it, an ombudsman role, where if they have problem with any federal agency, we try to be helpful to them. And uh, I must say, your congressional relations people at Laguna Niguel have been outstanding when we've needed help. Uh, they've done a very fine job and very receptive. Uh, I noticed this uh, article in the Washington Post, uh, Albert B. Crenshaw wrote, called The Struggling IRS Collects Its Fair Share of Problems. And they have this one case on, and I'm sure your uh, knowledge of love, Betty and Gerald Wesley of Annapolis. And the difficulties for the Wesley began after they missed a payment in November when Gerald Wesley became sick. Internal Revenue Service sent a notice that unless the couple caught up in 30 days, the installment agreement would be canceled and the full amount would be due. So the Wesleys quickly arranged a personal loan, paid up four days later. They made their next payment as scheduled and were confident the issue was behind them. On February 7th, however, the IRS seized the checking account, leaving them with 23 cents in cash. The matter was straightened out. The lien on their account was lifted the following Tuesday. The Wesleys, meanwhile, were left shocked and mystified at their experience. Quote, nobody at the IRS can explain why this happened. They honestly do not know, Betty Wesley, unquote, Betty Wesley said. 
reason that case interests me is I had a case exactly like that about a year ago where one part of the IRS was moving with a lien, the other part of the IRS was settling with the individual. When the individual got back, he found all his accountants tie, uh, accounts tied up, and uh, the fact was that uh, he couldn't pay his workers and he couldn't pay his tax bill. Uh, so how many of these do we have floating around where the right and left hand don't know what each other's doing? Um, th that's, maybe if you'll permit me, what I'd like to do is ask John Dalrymple to talk a little bit about the core issue that you identified, yeah. the lien issue, because I think maybe yeah. that sheds some general light. John? The, uh, the issue around uh, filing federal tax liens that you, you mentioned earlier, um, we, those are generally filed uh, by our field personnel. And uh, once that lien would have been filed on the taxpayer and we, we went to execute on it, uh, the taxpayer sent a payment in, in a particular case, the Wesleys. It is possible that the payment showed up after the lien or levy had been um, effectuated at the bank. The process is that the bank is generally to hold those funds, notify the taxpayer that they're going to be held for a period of time, and the taxpayer has an opportunity to uh, deal with the service uh, before those funds are actually taken and given back to the taxpayer. Uh, I can't really talk about this case specifically, but that's what generally is supposed to happen. Well, if you could, uh, since it's appeared in the papers, let's get a little analysis of the case, put it at this point in the record as to what happened and what went wrong. Is it communication, and have we got some management process by which that can be checked because, let's face it, that's a real shock when you go home and you can't to get anything because the lien's placed on your property, on your bank account, and all the rest. How are you going to even make the payment if you've got the money? And, and I, should, uh, I should make an explanation between lien and levy because they, they are two different things. And I think what's described in a newspaper article is, is a levy, which uh, generally arises out of a lien. And uh, a, a lien, of course, attaches to property, but until you actually eff effectuate some action, such as a levy, then it, uh, it just has the uh, effect of notifying other creditors that the IRS, in fact, is a creditor itself, protecting the government's interest. Uh, let me uh, pursue the year 2000 problem for a little while. This subcommittee started that discussion back in April of 96 with the executive branch. And just uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Gross, I read a lot about you in Time magazine here, and I want to put the Time story in the record. It says that uh, Arthur Gross, the assistant IRS commissioner, who is the agency's first world-class information systems officer. So I'm looking for a lot out of you with the endorsement of Time. I remember the uh, words of uh, the late George Murphy when he was in the Senate, who one day I questioned some article he was going to read as a Senate staff person, read into the record, and he put his arm around me and said, Steve, it's in print. It's got to be true. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming, Mr. Gross, that it's all true and you're going to solve the problem. So how are you solving it? The century day problem for the IRS is a world-class problem. Um, we have more than, potentially more than 100 million lines of computer code that are embedded in our core business systems and a variety of our field systems. Um, since April, we have made a very aggressive, as GAO reported, a very aggressive effort to gain command and control of the core business systems, the systems that process the 200 million tax returns, the uh, hundreds of millions of payment records that account for $1.4 trillion in tax payments each year. I would say at this point, we have reasonable command and control of the century date conversion for those core business systems. And it is far more complex than simply the application systems. There are major infrastructure problems. And what I mean by that is that we have more than 50 mainframe computers that have to interact with each other that support these core business systems across our 10 service centers and two computing centers. The century day conversion plan that we have developed and are in the, are in the midst of executing provides, therefore, not just for the application code analysis and conversion, but also uh, 
the upgrade where applicable of the infrastructure, the mainframe platforms, the telecommunications that support those systems. The second part of the Century Day Challenge for the IRS are our field systems. And while those systems do not provide for the core business support, processing tax returns, issuing refunds, processing tax payments, they're nevertheless important to the business of the Internal Revenue Service. And for those systems, we are in the midst of an inventory of both the application code and the infrastructure upon which that application code uh, functions. We don't know what we don't know. And what I mean by that is until we complete that inventory of those field systems, we're not going to be in a position to assess the extent of the problem or to execute a plan. Our projection is that we should have most of that inventory completed by June of 97, this June. And once that inventory is completed, we'll be able to provide a much more detailed decomposition of both the problem, the resources to correct it, and the plan for executing. Uh, I should say for the record that what we're talking about here is, is back in the 60s when you got your c present computer system. Uh, we didn't have very much capacity in computers in those days, and somebody had the bright idea, why use a four-digit year? Let's just put in 66 instead of 1966. They knew it would be a problem, but they figured technology would take care of it somehow. I take it then your computers from the 60s have <coughs> essentially used the two-digit year. Is that correct? Or was there a point where you've changed to the four-digit year? Uh, your first statement is correct that not only our computer systems of the 60s, but like many corporations and other government agencies, even computer systems generated and developed in the 70s, 80s, and even early 90s, um, typically have the two-digit date field. And that means that the application code analysis and conversion covers more than simply the legacy systems built in the 60s. It also covers a variety of applications built in the 80s and 90s. And interestingly enough, the commercial products that are purchased even as late as the, as the mid-90s are not necessarily century date compliant. And what that means is that we need to also evaluate each and every one of our commercial off-the-shelf products to assess compliance. We have initiated procurement um, and acquisition guidance to our procurement office so that since December of 96, we are not acquiring any commercial products until and unless they are validated and certified as Century Day compliant. Now, in brief, what happens when you get to the year 2000 with a uh, 66 uh, in there uh, and it becomes suddenly zero, 00 for the year 2000, the computer doesn't know what to do and you get some misinformation. Someone mentioned the other day, I don't know if it's true, that uh, various uh, delinquencies were issued. It was primarily in the Pentagon. I didn't know if that had happened in IRS, but uh, they, I think, got a 97-year delinquency because something f flipped over into the year 2000 and just sent the notice out. So that had to be corrected. Have you had any problems at this point? Uh, we, we have, Mr. Chairman, we have identified those application systems that do project out um, in the current year, and we have already converted more than 200 systems that have future year 2000 or beyond implications. So to date, we've been able to avoid that kind of a problem in the IRS. Now, presumably the figure the Gartner Group gave us way back in April was that it would be a $30 billion federal problem, a $600 billion worldwide problem on private and public computers, and the United States share would be half that because we're half the computers in the world. Now, the administration, when it sent up its budget for fiscal year 98, said it's a $2.3 billion problem. When we listened to Assistant Secretary Page in the Pentagon, who's in charge of that area, say we've just started trying to figure out what we're facing in the year 2000, and uh, we had submitted $1 billion of that $2.2 or $3 billion. And I guess I'd ask, uh, how are you analyzing the code? Can you put a price on it in terms of the human resource help or technical help that you have to get to solve the problem? And what are some of the problems that you're dealing with? 
of the 100 million lines of code that we're estimating, 62 million lines of code are, are in our core business systems for which we have identified a plan of conversion. Our projections are that we will be spending approximately $2.50 per line of code for that conversion. And that's based on an estimated 1,780 work years of effort from the date that conversion began to the date it's projected to be completed. We have not yet identified the total all-in costs for the infrastructure upgrades necessary to support those core business systems, nor have we yet estimated the cost of the conversion for the field applications, and we will not be able to do so until we complete that inventory. That's very helpful. Well, gentlemen, we have a, I know we've kept you a long time. We have some other questions. If you don't mind following our usual procedure, we'll submit them to IRS, and if you would give us a reply, we'll put it at this point in the record. So I thank you all for coming, and uh, I wish you well, because you got a tough job. But the key part, I think, is, before you get computer systems or anything else, is to think through what you're doing from a management standpoint and uh, try to get some integration of those numerous computer systems you've got right now, which I guess you're trying to figure out, Mr. Gross, how to get them to talk to each other effectively. And hopefully, do you feel the equipment off the shelf without sitting around doing what FAA did and what your predecessors did, uh, just getting uh, the, the last ultimate system, and you're never going to get it? You just need to take it off the shelf, I would think. Can, is there anything on the shelf that uh, makes sense for use with IRS? Or does everything have to be redesigned from ground zero? There are systems in the commercial market, for example, financial reporting systems that have applicability to, in our environment. Part of our modernization plan for the future is to identify, to the extent practicable, the application of commercial products in lieu of custom development. Good. I think that's a sensible way to go. Well, thank you all for coming. We have one more panel, one witness, and uh, Mr. Trinka, the uh, Chief of Staff of the National Commission on Restructuring the Internal Revenue Service. Please come forward. if you'd stand and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Let the clerk note that Mr. Trinka has affirmed that oath. Uh, Jeffrey S. Trinka has been Chief of Staff of this National Commission on Restructuring the Internal Revenue Service for how many months now? Ten months. Now. Ten months, about a year, and the Commission reports when? Uh, the end of June. End of June. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the interim thinking of the Commission in terms of the IRS? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for allowing me on behalf of uh, Congressman Portman to provide an update on the work of the National Commission on Restructuring the IRS. Mr. Portman, uh, who I believe is the newest member of this subcommittee, that is correct, sends his regrets and apologies that he could not make it here this morning. Let me begin by telling you a bit about the Commission and its work uh, to date. The Commission has 17 members, four from Congress, two from the administration, and 11 from the private sector or state government. Our congressional members are Senators Bob Carey, Charles Grassley, Congressman Portman, and Bill Coyne. So this Commission is both bipartisan and bicameral. The staff is made up of professionals with backgrounds in law, accounting, business management, and computer systems development. The Commission has a one-year life, and the final report will be completed in June, as I said. Over the last 10 months, our members and the staff have been digging through a mountain of reports, studies, and data from the IRS. We are also conducting a number of our own studies, including interviews of over 275 frontline IRS employees, most of the top IRS executives are here in Washington, discussions with business groups, tax preparers, and many other stakeholders. Additionally, we have ver been very active in solic soliciting input from the most important experts on the IRS, ordinary American taxpayers. We have communicated with many folks on our homepage and through town meetings. 
we have uh, also intend to conduct a uh, survey of taxpayers la later on this month. We have learned a great deal about the IRS and the challenges it faces. Let me briefly describe what we have found to date. Many of the problems at the IRS can be traced to three main areas, management and governance at the top of the tax administration system, inability to deliver quality customer service to taxpayers, mm -hmm. and the complexity of the tax code. First, in the area of management and governance, the Commission has found an agency that is unable to set long-term strategy and priorities and stick with them. I would like to stress that this phenomenon is historical in nature and not a product of a particular administration. The cur current IRS management and governance structure, which includes Congress, the Department of Treasury, and senior IRS management, does not ensure, one, that a shared vision for the agency can be developed and maintained over time Two, that priorities and, priorities and strategic direction can be set and maintained. Three, that accountability is imposed on senior management and a knowledgeable governing body. Four, that appropriate measures of success can be developed and used. Five, that budget and technology can be aligned with these priorities and strategic direction. And finally, that continuity and coordination of oversight is achieved so that problems can be caught at an early stage. Of these, the most crucial elements necessary for a turnaround at the agency are continuity, knowledge and expertise at the top, and accountability. In the Commission's view, the major technology and cultural changes that the IRS needs will require a governance structure that is capable of setting, implementing, and achieving long-term goals. Many of our commissioners have discussed publicly the possibility of creating a private sector-style board of directors at the agency with outside expertise that is accountable to the President and Congress and has the authority to hold top-level managers at the IRS equally accountable. A majority of our commissioners likely believe that any structure put in place at the IRS must fulfill the six criteria cited above if it is to have any likelihood of success. Let me briefly address another area on which the Commission's findings have focused to date, customer service. The Commission has found an IRS that has not successfully made high-quality customer service a top organizational priority. While the private sector has rewritten customer service standards over the last 25 years, IRS taxpayer service has retained, remained essentially static or has actually declined. Billing notices are confusing. Taxpayers have a hard time getting through on the phone. Taxpayers must contact the agency too many times to resolve even the simplest problems. IRS computer systems are not readily accessible for personnel to solve these problems once they do get through. Indeed, an IRS employee may have to access as many as nine different computer systems to resolve a taxpayer's problem. Taxpayers have become accustomed to increasingly high performance standards from their banks, credit card companies, airlines, and other service organizations. They have come to expect timely, accurate, and respectful service from both private companies and public agencies. The IRS must move aggressively, aggressively to close this customer service gap. Among other things, this involves improved technology, better training, and enhanced coordination between all elements of IRS customer service. Finally, the Commission is increasingly focused on the link between the complexity of the tax code and the shortcomings of the IRS. Mr. Chairman, I that the tax code is a matter for another committee but I would like to point out that the complexity of the code has a direct impact on the problems for tax administration. Even the best-run IRS would have a great difficulty administering the complex and ever-changing tax laws presently foisted upon it. Congress and the administration often act well-intentioned but overly complex tax laws without understanding the downstream problems they impose on the IRS and the average taxpayer. One reason is that the IRS does not have an independent voice in the tax writing process to make Congress and administration aware of the necessary administrative changes and tax form revisions required to implement new tax laws. Another reason is there is no incentive in place to encourage simplicity in the legislative process. And of course, there are some tax code provisions that create such administration and compliance nightmares that they need to be changed or repealed. The Commission's recommendations will address each of these issues. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by saying that the Commission's study to date has given us a good sense of where the IRS stands today. More importantly, though, it has helped the Commission to create a vision the agency needs to be 5, 10, and 15 years from now. The Commission's vision of the IRS for the next century is a service-oriented organization that will collect the proper amount of revenue by relying 
more on modern customer service practices and less on enforcement mechanisms. This highly trained customer service representatives would be able to resolve taxpayer problems on the first phone call. It is an IRS that operates under a simplified tax code, reducing inadvertent noncompliance. This summer, the Commission will challenge the President and Congress to create an agency that responds to the needs of taxpayers by fulfilling this vision. The Commission report will be comprehensive, outlining changes needed in congressional oversight, Treasury governance, IRS management, IRS operations and culture, computer systems, taxpayers' rights, and measures to simplify the tax code. This will be the first opportunity since 1952 for Congress to make such sweeping changes at the IRS. We look forward to working with the subcommittee. Thank you. Well, we thank you for testifying, Mr. Trenka, in your review of IRS operations and activities and their goals and role within our government. Uh, has the Commission come to any conclusion as to the attributes a new commissioner ought to have if they're to be an effective executive in the organization? Well, um, we have just now are reaching our recommendation stage of the process, so it is difficult uh, to predict totally. But I think going back to the points about continuity, knowledge and expertise and accountability that those those are direct can be directed as the commission well, as well to as what the does knowledge apply is it simply knowledge of the tax laws and the code or is it knowledge of how you run an organization it's knowledge on how to run an organization how to re-engineer processes how to bring large very complicated computer systems uh, and integrate them into those new processes uh, and the tax laws yeah. I'd like to ask the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Sanders, who has rejoined us, if he has some questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to congratulate you on, on conducting a very important uh, hearing. Uh, Mr. Trinkup, you are familiar perhaps with the recent reorganization plans of the IRS? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> can't tell you how, what impact they're having around the country, but I know that there are a lot of concerns about them in New England and in the state of Vermont. Uh, in Burlington, Vermont, which is our largest uh, city, we were uh, one of the offices, district offices, uh, that was centralized. Uh, as you know, Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts now form one district. Yes, sir. And uh, my impression is that that is not working in terms of improving uh, the IRS's relationship to consumers. Uh, we have seen a layoff of workers in Burlington, many of whom have been frontline people, people who have been able to respond to the day-to-day -day needs of Vermont taxpayers. Uh, thirdly, we have seen the very successful volunteer income tax assistance and tax counseling of elderly programs uh, uh, now being uh, coordinated out of the Boston office uh, rather than out of Vermont, which has not been a good thing. And uh, fourthly, we have seen uh, that IRS has instructed its taxpayer services personnel to route most telephonic inquiries by Vermont taxpayers to toll-free numbers in Boston. And I should add that from what we're hearing, uh, people are not making the connection. Not all of those phone calls are getting in. They're being kept on, on, the, on hold for a point, being shifted around, and so forth and so on. It, it seems to me, at least from what I am hearing from in Vermont, we have talked to many tax preparation people who are also concerned about uh, the lower quality of service. Uh, what, what's your judgment on, on the recent reorganization? Um, recently, we held two um, town meetings. We're going to hold two more, uh, one in Ohio and one in uh, Nebraska. Uh, and I have to say, uh, the disturbing uh, information we received in those town meetings was, was not necessarily from the unions or from the IRS employees. Uh, on the reorganization, but, but from practitioners, enrolled agents, uh, they're very, very much concerned uh, that there seems to be a sense of rolling back customer service areas right. into more urban areas. Uh, one practitioner uh, pointed out that this potentially could be uh, analogous to the uh, uh, state, the, the, the federal parks closing the uh, uh, Washington Monument to sort of uh, point out that, uh, uh, you know, what happens when you cut their budgets. Um, I, the Commission is still chewing on this issue right now, uh, but there were a lot of, of uh, 
concerns raised, and it seemed to be pretty uniform across lawyers, accountants, or enrolled agents, uh, everyone involved, sir. So this is not just a New England or Vermont concern? No, that's right, sir. I mean, it, it seems to me that if you cut back on employees who service people within a given region in a rural area, uh, if you have a 1-800 number which is not particularly effective, I mean, it is enormously frustrating. Here are taxpayers up against the wall, April 15th is coming, they're calling up, they need information, they're put on a hold, shifted all over the place. That does not do anybody any good, and I think it just uh, engenders more antagonism toward the IRS. So what you're saying then is at least what you're hearing even in the Midwest is that this reorganization is not working particularly well? Yes, sir. Do you have any thoughts about what we might want to, how some of us in Congress might want to respond to that? Uh, I think it's probably better our report from our perspective then rather than me get out in front of our commissioners. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me just ask one concluding question. Have you, has the commission and the commission staff had an opportunity to review the treasury plan with regard to any reorganization of the Internal Revenue Service? Yes, sir, we have. Uh, is there a reaction the commission has at this point? Uh, I, I think uh, there's some concern among some of the commissioners that it deals with just pieces uh, of the big picture. Uh, we hope to, to deal with the big picture. Uh, I think we go back to those three tests again on accountability, expertise, and uh, um, and continuity. Uh, the I take it your report then will have a critique of the Treasury's proposal? Uh, not specifically. I think it will. I think that the, basically the critique it's done overall will probably stand, even with the um, Treasury. Well, in other words, you're going to make your own report, but there won't be a closure as to detail of where the Commission feels the Treasury ought to either expand its proposals or think again about integration of the various functions. I mean, how are you going to approach that? Uh, well, I think our report, in a sense, will stand on its own. I don't. Uh, the, the well, Treasury sure report, will, the in way some senses, will will yeah. take takes steps towards some of those directions they might head in. But I see that the commissioners uh, uh, are interested in making a much more comprehensive and uh, dramatic steps than than was taken by the Treasury. Yeah, as you know, in the legislative body, the clash of ideas is what counts. And if the clash isn't clear. A lot of people are going to go hunting, fishing, misinterpreting, and so forth. And I would think when we have a group of experts such as you have on the staff and the commission in both parties, that it would be very helpful to the rest of us in Congress if the Treasury's plan was reviewed and some very pertinent points were made. You can reference other sections of your commission report. But there's got to be closure somewhere here as to what do you think, what do they think, ultimately, for what we will use to make some decisions. We've uh, experienced quite a bit of clash <laughs> on oh, this. Maybe stuff, that's why you're going to do nothing, and, and that's I, the I problem. Believe that, I believe that there will be a, a sharp yeah. contrast, sir. Okay. Uh, that's the problem with too much business around here. We compromise it down. Then we gripe when the executive branch issues regulations under it, when, frankly, we haven't given them specific directions so they know what they're doing. And they say, what are those people saying? What did they mean? So I'd like to see something that has a real sharpness to it, and uh, I think it would be very helpful to the Ways and Means Committee, the Appropriations Subcommittees, and to the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight, and this subcommittee in particular. Yes, sir. Well, we thank you very thank much you. for coming. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the staff that developed this hearing, uh, J. Russell George, the staff director of the Government Management Information Technology Subcommittee, Anna Miller, who's on my immediate left, professional staff member that prepared the hearing. John Hines, professional staff member that's done a lot of help in uh, letting the world know this hearing has existed. Uh, Andrea Miller, uh, our uh, clerk, uh, and faithful, helpful. And uh, David McMillan, the professional staff member for the minority. Uh, Mark Stevenson, professional staff member for the minority. Uh, Jean Gosa, the clerk for the minority. And we thank our court reporters, to whom we've put a little test this morning, on uh, Bob Cochran and Tracy Petty and uh, Katrina Wright. So thank you all. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Uh,
This is the statement of Mr. Sanders. We'll also introduce the statement of Mrs. Maloney, and they'll be put at the opening, st after the opening statements that were made by myself and others. Thank you very much. Without objection, we're adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.